when? Immediately or? Um, so I didn't put in. It, it was hard to tell. It was hard to tell from the because the the comments were real crunched up small on the side there. So it was it was hard to see what you replaced there. Could you just go back over that, please? Um, I didn't put in a specific effective date in the fourth paragraph, but the amendments would go into effect whenever we, you know, decide that is appropriate. And I, I have to let me pull up the document on my computer here. So it looks like I had not, I, I neglected to update the effective date. Um, but I do think that May 1st would be appropriate to sort of align our actions with the state actions as much as possible. Was that all, Jamie? Um, and then, uh... Okay, yep, thank you. Um, okay, Penny, go ahead. Yeah, I had a, just a general question. Um, having just kind of got this. Um, did, did we want to have something in there that aligns with that we will um, follow the, kind of the uh, approach laid out by the governor? And if things need to roll back, we will have to address just as the state will. I'm trying to figure out how we really say that what we're doing from this point forward is really following that guidance as laid out by the governor. Is that written in there somewhere? I didn't include it. Okay. Um, because it is a, you know, it's a state order at this point. She's okay. Making orders, um, so it seemed unnecessary, but we, we could okay. include that. Okay. As long as that's what people understand that we're doing. I think that's the key from my perspective is uh, clarity. Okay. Um, Matt, do you mind pulling up the document again? Happy to, Madam Chair. Any specific section you would like me to go to, go to Madam Chair? Um, maybe if we could just go to the last paragraph. Um, and include something Okay, I got you. Uh, after paragraph seven, that it is hereby encouraged, not specifically regulated. Maybe if we could include in that, that um, at the very beginning of that paragraph, that the intent is to follow the, I'm, I'm not feeling particularly eloquent right now, but um, something along the lines that the intent is to um, follow the guidance issued by the state. If, if I might, Valerie? Yes, please. Um, please do. I, Another way to do that might be to add a whereas clause at the beginning, um, whereas the governor has issued new guidance on reopening the state's economy, um, it, you know, uh, and the council finds that these actions are consistent with phase one of that plan. Um, we could, yeah, we could that add. Sounds, <laughs> that sounds cleaner. Um, Chris, I see your hand up as well. Uh, yeah, is uh, paragraph two now uh, duplicative of what has been imposed at the state level such that it's no longer needed? Yes. Um, I left it in because it, um, it just seemed like something that seems, it 
felt tentative on the state level, um, but we can take it out because it, it, it is duplicative. Um, but just so we don't get too far away from procedure and all that, um, I would like to move these amendments at this point um, to the order so that we can, you know, have something that we are we are discussing procedurally and then work from there. So I'm not sure if there's a, a second for my motion. Second. I'll, I'll second it. Okay. So let's let's continue our discussion now that we've got that on the table. Um, okay. And, and it's the motion for as it's drafted currently uh, as sent to Matt. That's right. Yes. So I would move that we further strike paragraph two. Okay. Second. Great. Any discussion on that? No. Um, all in favor of striking paragraph two? Um, Deb, could you please call? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Amendment passes unanimously. Great. Okay. Um, any other, Chris, do you still, did you leave your hand up or is it a new hand? Thanks. Um, okay, any other discussion on the motion? Penny? Are, are you adding that whereas at the beginning relative to the states, uh, whereas the governor blah, 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 that Jeremy suggested? He, um, I, that's, that's kind of the point where I thought we should get into procedure just to make sure that it's oh, clear. So it wasn't what I had initially drafted. Um, so if there's a, a motion to make that amendment, um, from Jeremy, is that? Um, yeah, I'd be glad to make the amendment, uh, to make that motion. Um, and I'm just pulling up the language from that Matt sent around from the governor's order so that I can cite the right order from the governor. Um, one moment. Okay, and I, I had temporarily forgotten that Deb had to call through everything. So for these next ones, I think what makes sense is to just get together a list of our amendments and then we can go through and vote on the amendments and then we'll We'll get through it all. Okay, um, so I, I would the the whereas clause I would propose would read um, whereas the governor has issued uh, new guidance on restarting Maine's economy, and the council finds the following measures to be consistent with phase one of that plan. Second, oh, Penny seconded. <laughs> Um, okay, any discussion on that? Yes, Matt. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, just, uh, I have, uh, whereas the governor has issued new guidance on restarting Maine's economy, the council, and if you'd be so kind, Councilor Gabrielson, to provide me those last five words. I just can't oh, keep up. <laughs> that's okay. Um, and the council finds the following measures to be consistent with phase one of that plan. A million thanks. <laughs> thanks. Um, okay, any other proposed amendments or any discussion um, on Matt, the amendments? Oh, sorry, I just raised my hand. <laughs> uh, Chris, and then back to Jeremy. Uh, so, Matt, can you just bring up what the actual text is with Fort Williams? Uh, if you don't sorry. mind, may, may, may I read it to you? I have two sure, computers sure. going here. Sure, <laughs> I, sure. I, I couldn't open the document on my share on the other one, but. Uh, the last, uh, or the, the last uh, paragraph will now state, whereas the governor has issued new guidance on restarting Maine's economy, the council finds the following measures to be consistent with phase one of that plan. 
and then the original text states, uh, and I'll share that part. I just want to see the actual language on the Fort Williams part. Yeah, and then uh, let's see. It is hereby encouraged, but not specifically regulated that all citizens of Israel. So up, up a page. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no uh, yes, on yeah, right uh, that. Just that, uh, paragraph uh, four. Paragraph four. Sorry, uh, four ways. No, no okay. problem. Yeah, that one, one. Uh, okay, that one I haven't edited yet. All right, so. So um, I'm okay with this approach. I would also support opening it to the uh, uh, alternative approach that I'm also okay with would be opening it entirely, but requiring anyone in the park to have uh, be wearing a face mask. Uh, so I would uh, support either of those two approaches. Um, are you moving an amendment to require a face mask? Uh, no, if I, if we required face masks, I would require I would I would allow people to drive in so long as they then had face masks. So the the rationale being to use the carrot of Fort Williams access uh, as a way of encouraging people to adopt a new norm of wearing face masks when out in public. But if we're just going to do foot traffic, um, I'm fine with leaving it as is without the face mask requirement but I, I do see the value of requiring it as well. But I mean, I can walk around on the, on the sidewalks and on the road and whatnot without a face mask. So I'm fine without it. But either of those two approaches I would support. Jamie? Um, I would put in language that encourages people to wear um, some sort of face mask or face covering generally, but not have it be a requirement and not have it connected to any broader, um, you know, uh, any any broader entrance uh, incentive or anything like. I, I think I think we need to be very careful about how we proceed with this. I'd I'd rather move slowly and deliberately. I think encouraging people to to wear face covering is appropriate, but I don't think we should be mixing. Um, either the park is safe for a certain amount of people, or it's not. And I, I would separate those two things. Um, if I may, while you have the floor, um, I, I would like us to consider pushing the date back just a little bit um, I, for two reasons. Number one is uh, it, it's more consistent with the governor's order relative to the coastal parks um, uh, to be closer to June 1st. Um, I, I'm, I'm willing to discuss something sooner than June 1st. I'm not set on June 1st, but I think if, if, we're, if we're trying to align and be consistent with the, the governor's order, um, that's part of stage two. Um, and I would argue that Fort Williams um, almost certainly attracts more visitors and traffic than any of the three coastal parks that are in our community, um, possibly even combined against the other three. So from a pure, um, Headcount standpoint, uh, I think Fort Williams uh, tops the list of those four. Um, but the, the main reason I'm, I would seek just a little bit more time is I think we need to be very uh, prescriptive and very deliberate about um, the measures that we take at the fort before swinging any gates open, whether they're foot traffic gates or, or vehicle gates. Um, so I'm just concerned that between now and Friday, which is May 1st, there's um, not enough time to take appropriate measures um, to put up signage to you know um, appropriately cordon off areas that shouldn't be uh, accessed um, uh, to designate parking spaces all of that kind of stuff to train staff to equip staff with personal protective equipment should they need it um, I just think all of that's going to take more time than than two business days following this meeting to be ready to open on Friday so um, I, I don't know what that date is, and I, I would actually turn to Matt um, for, you know, Matt and Kathy for a, a recommendation um, that's reasonable to, to get staff prepared and, and um, take some of those steps that I think are necessary. Um, and then uh, I, I, I would support uh, otherwise the measure that's on the table. And Matt or Kathy, do you 
have a brief response to that. I, I would share Councilor Garvin's uh, thoughts as well. I think uh, it would take us a little bit of time to get outfitted, uh, possibly get some signage, uh, better signage up than we had uh, leading up to the last, uh, well, prior to the closure, as well as uh, some other alterations we may be able to make within the park to uh, accommodate that, uh, that may be, uh, it's supposed to rain on Thursday and we may have some bad weather and may take a little bit of time to get uh, staff to get that up to speed. But I think if we had a week, maybe a little bit more than that, I think we, what do you think, Kathy, could we accommodate that? I think, yes, I would think at least another week. We have to get the signs, we'd have to get the, um, I know Chris has a plan in place to open it to um, pedestrian traffic, but there is some things that need to take place first. Um, you said at least a week, but what, what would be ideal? Not this coming Monday, maybe the following Monday. That give us two weekends of preparation. That was the other thing I was going to suggest that it not be opened up on a Friday. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, again, from the from the perspective of easing into things, um, I think opening up on a, a weekday or midweek is a, a better way to go. Um, okay. Um, Valerie, did you have a comment on this item? Yes. Okay. I, um, I'm in complete um, agreement with Councillor Garvin. I, um, I'd rather we moved a little slowly. I, I will support this with some changes. However, I do want to point out also that the governor's order does not apply to any coastal parks or beaches. And that's what um, we have. It's a slower opening for coastal parks and beaches. I'm also concerned because so many people have talked about um, the traffic on Shore Road, which, which I've seen. Uh, how do we keep, it sounds like there's gonna be even more traffic now. People are gonna try and park on Shore Road. I think that's something that um, we have to think about too. There's an increase in traffic on Shore Road. I'm also concerned about um, the operating hours. There's nothing in here that talks about the operating hours. Um, maybe we need to put something in there so that um, people know what the hours are. Um, also, dogs on leash. If we're doing social distancing, I think a um, six foot leash is um, appropriate since um, dogs are part of people's family and people touch their dogs. Um, if we have dogs off leash, I think that could create a lot of problems. So I think we really need to look at um, dogs on leash. The signage is super important. And um, I think um, being very deliberate and moving slowly with this is, is going to be important. Um, Jeremy? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask relative to this language from an operational perspective. Um, so um, a couple of areas of concern that I have, even with opening it to pedestrian traffic, um, there's, a, there's a few pinch points where larger groups larger than 10 people tend to congregate naturally anyway. I'm thinking particularly around the lighthouse and the sort of the, the selfie spots um, on, on the trails on either side of the lighthouse, um, as well as the picnic areas. Um, and so one thing that I'm curious from Matt and Kathy is if you think this language would give you guys enough operational latitude to, you know, sort of put measures in place to control the number of people who are congregating there, um, or if you'd like more specific language. Um, the other one is on designated handicapped parking. Um, if we wanted to make some of those spaces outside the fort that people are using designated handicapped, is that something that we would need to specifically authorize with this order or would you like to, or is that something that you can just sort of take care of operation? I think you'd have to specifically identify those as handicapped, at least on the outside. Uh, the chief could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe uh, that would take council order uh, to, to create that. Um, and then as far as uh, folks congregating down there, I think, uh, you know, we, we do have rangers, but we would like to, you know, obviously, I think signage would be critical at the lead into the park to 
uh, reinforce social distancing measures and uh, and remind people to to practice those. Uh, so I think that maybe a couple of strategies we would take there, and uh, you know, staff would have to if, encourage folks to move along if they did tend to want to gather down by uh, you know a Captain Strout Circle down. You know, right now it's currently under construction. Uh, we've got a landscaping project going down that we're trying. <laughs> we've taken advantage of the downtime to. To get some work done that was originally planned so uh, but that's that's going forward uh, the, the one thing that does come to mind is if uh, if there is very limited parking within the fort uh, is the impact on the surrounding neighborhood if, if if there is no parking that is there I know the chief and I have spoken about this uh, at length uh, the concern would be you know would the council then have to create orders for the surrounding streets to say that there's no on street parking and uh, concerns for that uh, whereas I think uh, you know, a soft opening might be accomplished with the central lot and perhaps Captain Strout Circle where you accommodate your uh, uh, handicap. There is handicap parking already identified. It probably would account for roughly 75 to 100 spaces. And if you think about that, one to four people average in a car uh, with social distancing, maybe average would be two. Uh, you could put, be talking about 100 to max 400 people over 100 acres uh, of the park. I think we could probably accommodate that, um, you know, s respectfully. And then the other thing, uh, uh, thinking about with dogs off leash, you may want to. I think that you're spot on with that as far as uh, off leash, at least for the interim. Uh, I think you may want to consider on leash during the a certain period of time a day. That uh, that's what uh, that's what. Portland and South Portland have both instituted on their uh, language on theirs as well. So I think we can accommodate anything the council would like to see, uh, but I would, uh, and I know that, uh, you know, one of the concerns that had been identified uh, was it, like ADA accessibility is also uh, a concern there as well. Uh, and I think we could meet that uh, requirement, at least based on what the uh, town's attorney thinks as well to get us in compliance with uh, Americans with Disability Act uh, uh, language. So I know I just said a lot, but uh, I <laughs> wanted to get as much out there to help you move along with your uh, with your thought process. And Jeremy, just a couple different things too that will be taking place. Um, we were talked about covering the binoculars, securing those so that people are not using those. The playground and swings would still be secured and closed off and um, potentially moving picnic tables so that there's not large groups of picnic tables in any given area. Penny, go ahead. Okay, first of all, um, I, I really support opening of, um, of the park as, as we've discussed it. And it appears that um, Matt and Kathy have done um, a lot of uh, homework around it. And um, I, I don't disagree with, uh, Jamie in in that opening on a Friday could be a challenge. I I would tend to say May 6th, which is a Wednesday, uh, do something uh, midweek. Um, I, I, I don't uh, support um, anything around uh, uh, suggestion requirement or whatever around face covering because we are asking people uh, to do the social distancing. And so um, I know that Portland did something uh, just the other night and I don't necessarily um, uh, support that kind of um, decision. I also believe such as what Valerie has said, uh, regarding dogs on leashes, because I think dogs will cause people to interact more closely than uh, what we're hoping. And, um, and it appears, again, that uh, Kathy and Matt have put a lot of uh, thought into how we can make this work, support um, the uh, ADA, and uh, also make sure that we have uh, um, put as much signage and where that signage needs to be. So I would propose that we um, open um, toward the 6th and uh, the 11th at the latest. Thank you. Um, Chris and then Jamie. 
So uh, I'm going to make a motion here. Uh, I move that we amend uh, the language of paragraph four to add the following sentence. Uh, Dogs within Fort Williams shall be restrained by leash at all times. Okay. Um, while you're making that motion, do you care to add some other amendments to it so we can take them up um, about an effective date, perhaps? Uh, <laughs> where would we put the language? Uh, if, uh, if you bring the, the order up, I can take a stab. The dog one was easy because it's a standalone sentence. Um, effective date, I'm uh i'm with penny um looking at basically the the i i recognize the argument that um the coastal uh state parks are not opening till june um yet at the same time this is our local neighborhood park um which kind of weighs the other direction well it, 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 the other state parks are opening may 1st um but then as jamie noted um uh, it's going to take some time to get things up and running. So all that hemming and hawing back and forth, uh, May 6th works. Uh, I thought that was a reasonable date, uh, in part because it's after Cinco de Mayo. Not that if I could just jump in, I think Kathy had said um, that preferably would be after that, is that like May 11th? I like May 6th. So <laughs> if you push me to make a motion, it will be the 6th. But if someone else wants to make the motion for that one, um, although I do it, uh, yeah. But so I, you're, we you're still need a second for the dog. Yeah. So it's right now, it's my, my motion is just the dog. Okay. Madam Chair, I have one, one question, if I may. Yes. Uh, the one uh, area that I did change was uh, the, the uh, Exhibit A language. I did remove that from there. Uh, uh, that was in that paragraph as well, if that, was, if that would please the council. I don't know if you'd like to have a motion uh, for that, but I uh, took that part out. Still maintain the, the weight of it regarding uh, the uh, the, uh, the businesses in the park just took out the exhibit a section section. Okay, I don't know. So if, if you don't mind me interrupting, I apologize. But no, so my, my dog motion would further include, uh, it would be at, uh, making that modification of that paragraph. And in addition to that, striking the reference to exhibit A as uh, detailed by the town manager. Second. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I'm going to, just to keep track of these, I'm going to refer to Jeremy's motion to amend the whereas clause as A, Amendment A, um, just for the sake of discussion, and I'll note Chris's as B. Um, Jamie, you've had your hand up for a little while. Thanks. Um, two things. Uh, first, um, um, by way of the language uh, pertaining to the leashes, I don't know if it makes more sense to have language more to the effect of um, temporarily suspending the existing rules within the park pertaining um, to, to uh, dogs on leash, et cetera. Um, so anyway, for, I, I'd be more comfortable with something like that than a new stipulation about a leash requirement, but I, I guess it's the same outcome either way. But um, the other thing I had a question about was um, the portable restrooms. Are they to be available? Not, uh, I would strongly encourage them to not be, um, but I know that pro you know presents other problems, but I think that that's um, a major issue for us from a public health perspective. Was, 
And then, and when, whenever we're done talking about the Fort Williams stuff, I want to, I do want to make some points about the short-term rental too, before we move all the amendments. Okay. So I don't know if you want to take all the Fort Williams stuff, vote on those amendments, and then circle back to short-term rental before we move the whole motion altogether. Yeah, I think that that, that sounds good. Um, was that a question for, for Kathy and Matt about the... Question on what the current plan is and, and if it differs from what my hope is, then I'll include language to the effect of <laughs> closing those off uh, by order of the council. But I don't think that's necessary, but I'll listen to what they have to say. Okay. Kathy. The plan the plan was to not have those utilized if we reopen to the public right now. They're there and it would be some monitoring of keeping them unused. But I think the rangers and the greeters would be busy monitoring the people and the park for safety purposes and keeping people where they should be, and the Porta Johns would be. Can we forcibly bad. close them? Like uh, s somehow secure them so that I, I don't think we want people just standing there watching and preventing people from using them. But I, if, if, right. if they're not somehow secured, then, then people are going to use them. Bob, do you have any idea if there's a way to secure them closed? If, I mean, even if we just rope, literally rope them off around them or well, something. I, you we know. could do that. Yeah. 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 Kathy, Kathy, if you, if, sorry. Kathy, if you need me, we can secure them with police tape. We've done that with some gates around town. I also do that the night before the beach to beacon to, to secure them. Make sure they're not utilized with all the porta potties on Route 77. So I can do that if if you think that would work. Bob, yeah, I was just going to echo what the chief said. They could be secured with caution tape. Uh, they have hasps on them. They can be locked with panel locks. So I think there's a way to secure them from. Okay, um, Jeremy, did you have another fort amendment? Um. I just, I wanted to propose, it relates to the fort, um, but I wanted to propose in terms of an effective date. Um, because this order continues the short-term rentals, I think the overall effective date should be midnight tonight, because I don't want that short-term rental part to lapse until May 11th. Um, but then add an effective date of May 11th for the opening of, of pedestrian traffic to Fort Williams. Okay, would that be added to paragraph four? The paragraph four, yes. Um, is there a second for that amendment? Second. I didn't see who that was, sorry. Chris, for discussion purposes. Thanks. Um, yeah. Yes, Matt? Uh, just, a, just a quick question, Madam Chair, uh, for, for Councilor Gabrielson. On uh, the effective date, if, if this would be your intention, uh, looking further up uh, the document, if you uh, mm -hmm. would bear with me for a moment, uh, looking up top here, what I have made for the edit there, uh, as you see towards the uh, the fourth line up from the bottom, effective April, and I turned that into 29th, 2020 at 12.01 a.m., which would be uh, after midnight this evening or tomorrow morning. Great. Is that, it was, is that consistent with what you were uh, requesting? That, that is what I was requesting. And then I, I, for, the, for the April 11th, I would suggest adding a sentence after the first sentence of four that would read, the effective date for, of opening the park for pedestrian traffic shall be May 11th. Okay, I can do that too. Okay, um, I do want to not get too far into the time allotted for the for the school budget. So um, I'd like to wrap up the fort discussion and move on to Jamie's short term rental discussion. Um, so is there any further points or amendments that anyone wishes to make regarding the fort itself? All right, so the oh yes, Chris, I uh, just going to note that um, I'm going to vote one way on A and B in a separate way on C. So I'm Okay, so we'll pull C yeah. out. So Amendment A is Jeremy's um, whereas clause referencing the governor's order. Amendment B is Chris's amendment that dogs must be leashed at all times and striking the reference to Exhibit A. Um, so all in favor of those two amendments. 
Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Amendment passes unanimously. All right, and then regarding Amendment C, which is the effective date of the order, April 29th at 12.01 a.m., and the effective date of paragraph four, May 11th, 2020. Um, all in favor of that amendment. Councilor um, Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Um, before I cast my vote, uh, just a point of order, had, had discussion con concluded on that before the vote was called for? Um, Penny, you look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. I, I, thank you, uh, Jamie. I was going to say something when my name got called. Um, um, I'm confused about what you, what you just put forward to vote on because I agree with when what we change in here will the order is effective but at such and such a time the 28th yada 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 but the date for the fort i would vote differently on right that's so what we're doing now we're okay specifying the date on the fort right now well what was said was not just the date on the fort right jeremy had moved both the effective date of the order to be april 29th at 12:01 a.m the order that we're doing now, as well as the May 11th effective date of the fort in paragraph four in the same if, motion. If it pleases the chair, I would, I'd be willing to separate those. And, and okay, I was them. confused by that too, sorry. Or roll calls. Okay, so we'll just address the effective date of May, just the fort, because we, that's what my intent was to conclude discussion about the, the fort itself. So. Um, amendment is to have an effective date for paragraph four regarding the fort of May 11th, 2020. So I, I think we'll need to restart that vote. That specifically is what the amendment is. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? No. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries six yay, one nay. Okay. Um, Jamie, I wanna come back to you on, you said you had a point about short-term rentals. Yes, thanks. Um, so can you just, Matt, pull up that language and the date associated with that. That should be, uh, I think the short term mental section is there under number uh, three. Actually, now it's now it's number two because uh, right. number number two on this had been. So I just I just can't see very well on the screen there. The the what's the date associated with this? The effective date? Oh, uh, at the present time, uh, it had an effective date of April second, and this would be extending it to May thirty first. Um, so I would I would like to make an amendment to that um, to be extending it to. June thirtieth, um, and I'll be happy to discuss my rationale for that if there's a second for the for the motion. I second it. Thank you, Penny. And just to be clear for everyone, there J Jeremy's motion to amend the effective date of the order to April 29th is also still on the table. So we'll we'll call that one D and Jamie's expiration date will be E. 
All and right, any discussion on that? The date for E was what day again? June 30th. So to coincide with stage three of the governor's plan. Um, so I understand through looking through the plan um, uh, earlier today that lodging, which is um, not very concretely defined in the plan, mm -hmm. um, is set for stage two in June. Um, with the provision that it be open to Maine residents and out-of-state residents who have completed quarantine guidelines. Um, that's very vague and, and unclear to me because one would presume that once folks get here, they have, they have to quarantine for 14 days, um, which I'm not sure is consistent with the whole nature of our short-term rental properties to begin with. Second of all, I think it would be ridiculously impossible for us to enforce that. Um, and then the, sec but the second more important part of that is um, what's outlined in stage three for lodging, which does broaden uh, slightly the definition of lodging to be hotels, campgrounds, summer camps, RV parks for Maine residents and visitors. But also, and this is the important part for me, that the administration is developing guidelines including potential re testing requirements to assist all of those types of properties uh, in being able to safely reopen. And more importantly, and this is where it really comes in for short-term rentals, that reservations should not be taken until those guidelines are issued. So I don't think that there's any way that we can open up short-term rentals without those kinds of provisions in place. So I would say June 30th, and you know, if I'm being quite honest, it won't surprise me if we have to revisit this as that date comes closer, but anyway. Okay. Uh, any more discussion on that? Um, Chris, yes. Uh, it, it, Jamie, do you see any value in us uh, just, uh, I don't know how it would play out, just striking the paragraph in its entirety and deferring to the governor on this issue? No, right. because I think unfortunately the, the governor and other officials have been, you know, if I'm being quite honest, I think they're avoiding it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know that some other cities and towns in the area have taken some steps for different reasons to try and, um, you know, eliminate um, the incentive for hosting short-term rentals uh, to begin with. But I, I, I'm not, it's not clear to me why they have not been more um, prescriptive about this particular lodging type. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two, I'll say that, um, you know, specifically I've had constituents reach out asking what is the status of short-term rentals? How are these going to be impacted? All that kind of stuff. So as far as it relates to citizens in Cape, I think that they need very clear direction from us on this. And um, that's what I'm looking to do here. Good points. Um, all right. Any other discussion on that particular amendment? No. Uh, seeing none. Um, any other discussion? Oh, I guess so. Let's let's get through these amendments. Um, unless there are any other proposed amendments before we move on. No. Okay. So, um, unless there's an objection, I'd like to take them up together. Um, the order effective date of April 29th. 2020 at 12.01 a.m. and an uh, expiration date of June 30th, 2020. Um, does anyone want to pull one of those out for a vote? No. All right, so we'll take those two up together. Uh, Councilor Devereaux, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, go Councilor, ahead. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Amendment carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if there's no other discussion about further amendments um, to the proposed amended order, I'd like to take up the initial motion um, for the order as amended this evening. Um, any further discussion on that? Seeing none. Okay, all in favor. Oh, 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 yeah. Yes, Jeremy. Um, do we want to add language to the order to address the temporary parking bans on side streets? I um, believe that would be. 
Oh, we, is that necessary by, that was unclear to me whether that was necessary by council order or whether that's operational. It may be good to get the chief uh, to, weigh, to weigh in on this. Um, we have typically put them up for for uh, the temporary in fashion. So if it's for a temporary period of time, then I think that uh, temporary no parking emergency signs would be sufficient. Okay. Um, and do we need an amendment to designate parking spaces as handicapped, or can that, as the as the order reads, allow for? spaces to be designated as handicapped once the park does reopen to foot and vehicular, I mean, uh, foot and bicycle traffic? I think we're gonna allow that once, it, once it's opened up. Um, the, we, do those parking areas already have those designations, the areas that you're talking about opening up? Well, it was, it was vague. Um, so it says simply that, um, limited parking shall be provided for those individuals in need of accommodation due to disability, but not that the park is open to vehicular traffic. So we're talking about off premises parking for the fort. Um, I'd have to look into that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare say at this point because that's kind of a unique situation here. So I'd have to check the statute on that. Um, Chris? So um, the, the providing accommodations uh, to people due to disability, I totally understand the rationale behind it, um, but I am concerned by it just because it means we're gonna have to have someone at the gate basically 20, the, the, the entire time the park's open, um, interacting with people to say, oh, if you have a disability, I'm gonna let you into park, but otherwise you have to turn around and go away and park on a street somewhere. So it, it, we're creating a manpower issue. And I, I know nothing about what the laws are with ADA and whatnot, but I scratch my head and I think about the fact that Robinson Woods doesn't require that people be able to drive into the center of Robinson Woods to park if they, they, if they need accessibility. And it seems like providing accessibility parking on the outskirts of the, the, the entrance to the fort should be uh, sufficient so we wouldn't have to have gates open for and have them staffed, but I have no idea how all this works. Um, so I'm scratching my head and looking for guidance if there is any. Right, I mean like, practically speaking, there is that small parking lot um, outside of the park by the fort. And if this language suffices to then allow some of those parking spaces to be designated as handicapped, I think that's kind of the, the question. Got it, so we do still have the gates closed and we would potentially designate all of that parking as ADA accessible parking or a large, or some chunk of it, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Right, some limited parking. Uh, Jamie? Sorry, I didn't mean to have my hand raised. Okay, um, so, so Matt or um, Chief Fenton, um, would that language allow for some of those spots to be designated as handicapped. I think we could do it under a temporary order before I give a, I'd, I'd have to do a little bit more research before I feel get comfortable giving you a 100% answer. I'd wanna make sure that we've uh, investigated it thoroughly, um, but it's a unique situation, but we do set up temporary parking. Um, sometimes it's just difficult outside of the fort. So we're definitely looking at allowing parking outside, but only foot traffic inside. Right. Okay. Uh, Jamie? Um, I, I'm not 100% clear either. I happen to know somebody really well who knows a lot about um, accessibility parking, um, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that just designating the spaces actually, you know, it, the, the spaces have to be functionally adequate for that purpose. Um, so uh, we might not be able to solve this specifically right now. And if it does, it is something that requires council action. I don't know if a more appropriate action might be something broadly worded to um, provide uh, the authority to both the manager and the police chief um, to come up with um, the recommended parking plan to suit uh, the intention of this order, so. 
Krista, do you want to move that amendment? Uh, sure. Okay, so uh, it would be amended paragraph four, the second sentence would be amended to state that um, the council confers authority on the manager and chief of police to um, provide parking consistent with um, ADA requirements. Does that sound good? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, just consistent with the intent of this order. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so leave leave the second sentence in, but then add a sen a third sentence after that that says that the council confers authority on the town manager. I th I think. It, it, sorry, Valerie. To I, I think. The key part about this is that I'm not sure that that space outside the old gate, uh, the old entrance, is is going to work um, for a couple of different reasons. So I think we need to grant um, grant the manager and police chief the flexibility to designate the appropriate spots and and a, a working plan that supports the intent of this. And if that means that the main gate is going to have to be open and we have the big message board sign out in front that says you know parking available only for accessible plates or something like that then we'll have to figure that out but I, i'm just i'm not 100 percent sure that we can just say oh those spots that are right outside the old gate are going to work for this and and leave it at that right no i'm just trying yeah. to capture what you were saying so so we'll leave in the sentence that says limited parking shall be provided for those individuals in need of accommodation due to disability period and then another sentence the council confers on the town manager and police chief authority to designate parking for or consistent with this order to take measures consistent with this order. Um, to designate, designate parking and take measures consistent with this order. Madam Chair, if, if I may uh, make a uh, recommendation, uh, designate parking consistent with the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, consistent with this order, or designate parking uh, conforming to the Americans with Disabilities Act and consistent with this order, would that be, would that be fine? Yes. Okay. So the proposed amendment would be the council confers, so adding after the second sentence of paragraph four, the council confers on the town manager and chief of police the authority to designate parking and take measures consistent with this order and conforming to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that should give you the space to work. Yeah. Um, okay, is there a second for that amendment? Penny, are you seconding or adjusting? I, Jeremy, I think just seconded. Um, okay, so Jeremy seconded. Um, any further discussion on that amendment? No, all right. Um, any other discussion on amendments or the motion, the initial motion on the table before we vote on both this amendment um, and then subsequently on that? Okay, so on the amendment, all in favor? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Um, yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. 
Amendment passes unanimously. Okay. Um, and now taking up the initial motion, which is to um, accept the order as amended this evening. Councillor, Ga uh, excuse me, Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries as amended. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for working through that. I know this has not been the smoothest process, but it's a, it's a very strange situation that we're all in. <laughs> Um, okay, so move on quickly. We do have two more items on this agenda before getting into the school budget. Um, the next one is item 65-2020. Madam um, Chair, yes. Madam Chair if I may, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, at this point, the council may want to uh, uh, take a motion to recess and then uh, take up the next uh, the special meeting uh, for the workshop and then, uh, and then come out of recess to address uh, number 65 is a little bit of bold uh, talking about the council will hold, uh, we'll, we'll take uh, a pause at this point and then take up the second part because their discussions uh, oh, and the yes, next segment will be part that. of that. Sorry, okay. sorry to, to interrupt. No, that, that sounds good. I was anxious about we're eating up too much time. Okay. So, okay. Um, do we do we need a motion to recess or, or do we just recess? We need a motion. Yeah, you, you need a motion to recess. And then Deborah will have to do another roll call. She's getting okay. really good at it. <laughs> She's very good at that. Uh, do I have a motion to recess? Um, and we would return to the next two items after the uh, finance committee workshop. So moved. Councillor Deborah, is there a second? Second. Councillor Penny Jordan, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. We stand in recess. Does anybody need a uh, break? Are we all ready to go? Good to go. Okay, um, so with that, we'll convene a uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Finance Committee uh, workshop for Tuesday, April 28th, 2020. Um, is there anybody from the public that uh, wishes to make any public comment at this time uh, on the agenda? Um, if you're interested to make any comment, um, please uh, indicate so by uh, raising your hand with the raise hand function. And uh, just introduce yourself with your address and limit your comments to about three minutes. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so we'll move into the agenda. Uh, is, um, are there members of the school board Present? Yes, I think we are uh, yeah, I think okay. all present and accounted for, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you guys for joining us back for um, a second night. Um, I again want to thank, uh, thank you for the time and effort put in on the budget uh, for all the presentation um, that we saw yesterday. Um, so as we um, talked about uh, during the presentation and following the, in our discussion yesterday, um, you know, wanted to have a chance to come back, uh, have counselors ask questions, uh, engage in more dialogue, um, specifically uh, around the budget. Um, so that's what the purpose uh, uh, purpose here is tonight. Um, one of the things that I had asked of Matt um, yesterday um, was to come back to us uh, to let us know 
um, if we were to be in a position where we need to, um, uh, you know, be having discussion around budget reductions, things like that, I was trying to um, get a sense of um, and a frame of reference, a point of reference for what we were talking about. Um, as all the counselors are aware, and, and many school board members have seen as well, um, you know, we've certainly had, um, uh, 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 you know, communication and outreach from the public um, uh, requesting budget reduction. So I just wanted us to be able to ground that discussion tonight, uh, if that's the direction we go in, around what that would mean. So Matt, do you want to um, sort of give an overview of what uh, you and I had a chance to talk about earlier today and, um, and uh, sort of explain that, all that, uh, basically the effect on mill rate that was the question I had asked about last night. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to John Q. Uh, he was with us last night and tonight, uh, and uh, he and I were working today on uh, uh, trying to come forward with an answer to uh, your questions, uh, Councilor Garvin, and uh, for the board. Uh, one of the thoughts was, what would be the impact? So for every, to lower the mill rate for every penny, what would that actually mean in real, expend in real expenditures? So looking at that, for every, uh, the short answer is, for every penny that is desired to be reduced off from the mill rate, you're looking at, uh, you'll need roughly $17,400 to be reduced in spending. So for instance, if, uh, if one wanted to go from, you know, from $20 to uh, 2007, which is the current forecast down to say uh, $20, you would just take seven cents and multiply it by 17,429. So you'd say seven, if one takes seven cents off, 17,429 times, you'd have to reduce the, the budget by $122,000. So that's kind of how, how that would work uh, uh, effectively. So that's kind of the, what your real dollars are looking like. Okay, thanks for that, Matt. Um, so are there, uh, any counselors that wish to start off? Um, I, I, before we get um, before we get too deep into council discussion, I, I should say um, either Elizabeth or anybody else for the school board. Was there any any other um, sort of introductory remarks you wanted to make or no? Okay. Um, so counselors, um, if you've got questions, uh, comments you want to make, discussion. Um, why don't we get into into that? Chris? Yeah, so Matt and Q, um, roughly with the numbers you're saying, so to to have a flat uh, flat uh, tax rate would be a cut of about what? Like 780,000? What, what are we looking at? Roughly 973,000. Penny. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is to uh, Donna or Elizabeth, um, uh, but I think last night uh, Valerie Devereaux asked an interesting question and I, I've been pondering it and um, thought of some other things as well. And you may have covered this last night, but um, um, that was a lot of dense information you covered last night. So anyways, um, for dollars that have not been expended for this school season as a result of whether it be sports not happening or um, um, what, what, what of that can be carried over to next year. And also for employees that are not direct service to the uh, students at this point in time. Have any of them been uh, furloughed or um, is everybody still currently on uh, payroll, so to speak? I'm going to give this to Donna and Marcy. Okay, so currently everyone is, on, is still on payroll. Um, 
most of them either are either working or out on um, psycho, some type of sick leave um, connected with um, the virus or um, their, their condition. Um, as far as the coaches go, uh, Jeff Thorak and I have been working on this and um, varsity coaches that some varsity coaches are still working with their students do, or their, their teams doing virtual trainings. Um, so there are um, two or three levels of payment that coaches are receiving at this point. Some started out planning for the season and so they, they will be paid. Um, I just saw a, a, an email come through from Jeff Thorak with a list and I didn't get to really look at it, but um, he was collecting the data on that. Um, some some uh, worked at the beginning, so they would be getting a, per, a percentage of um, of the days that they that they did work with their teams, um, thinking that um, that we might have sports this this spring. So um, so the question, so the answer is we do have some people that are working. Uh, many people, uh, school employees, um, food service people. We have many who are working to prepare the food that's going out. The custodians um, are all, unless they're on sick time, they're all working, um, cleaning our buildings. Um, uh, I know that Perry's had them in uh, various places around the town, cleaning, uh, maintenance is, is working. Um, our bus drivers are not working, um, but their contract um, carries them throughout the year uh, if there is a school closure, so. So is there, are there no um, types of expenses that are um, not being um, experienced as a result of the school being closed. So I, I guess my point is there has to be something that um, you're not expending dollars on. So Marcia, I'll, I'll start that and then you can go, okay, Marcy. Okay. So obviously gas for buses um, because mm -hmm. we're, we're not running our buses. Um, and I don't know if you have the figures on that, Marcy. Um, our, um, our referees and expenditures that have to do with um, the, the spring games for the spring sports are a couple. Yes, um, that's correct, Donna. We will have some savings we're projecting in our line items for substitutes. Um, however, in one of our schools, that line item was going over a bit, so that so we're able to actually prevent having a problem with that area. Um, our maintenance costs were going, we're starting to run over. So some of our savings we're hoping will um, make up for a couple of areas that we are having some rough spots with. Right now, we are projecting that um, savings that we would have potentially hundred thousand to use from our carry our fund balance to carry over into next year. And then from that point, we'll have our auditors do the audit and we'll know what the final fund balance will come out to be. And we can plan on any savings that we recoup from this year to um, relieve the taxpayers going into next year with a final audited amount. So the answer is yes, Penny, we will have some savings in some areas, um, but we are also keeping our eye on the, our nutrition services as another area that we may have to pick up for um, out of our contingency account. And I'm in the process of right now of working with our auditors to figure some of that out too. Does that answer your question, Penny? Did you have further follow-up? That answers that question. I have others, but other people can ask questions. Uh, Councilor Devereaux? Oh, no, sorry, Matt. Uh, first, Matt just wanted to correct the number he gave us before. Sorry, Matt. Yes, I, I apologize, Councilor Straw. I, uh, in my haste to do the math on that, uh, you, I, I misinterpreted your question, and I apologize. Uh, you had asked, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in order to have a zero impact on the tax rate, uh, you needed to know that amount. Yep. Is that correct? And that, that number is $679,731. I apologize. I was looking at the, uh, I was looking at the, the total taxes to be raised and uh, that does not ac account for the increase in assessed value. So 
Got I it. changed the number, and I apologize for the. Uh, and I, I estimated, and I knew I'd be off with the estimate, but I was kind of like, "Wow, that was." <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I apologize, and that's that's what we're looking at. Um, Councilor Devereaux. Thank you. Um, so, um, Superintendent Wolf, from what I'm, I'm sure there's other things too, like field trips, utilities, um, graduation. There's a lot of things that um, you're not going to be spending money on that you'll be um, looking at saving some of those funds. So I'm just curious, you know that schools closed um, through the end of the year. So you're basically saying there's no um, savings at all on, on, um, on staff and employees, none? Um, there won't our be staff, no furloughed? Our, our staff are working. All the ed techs are, are supporting students and the teachers are teaching remotely and and the bus driver's contract um allows for them to be paid yes when they don't work yes okay all right um so basically you're saying that no one is going to be furloughed is that's correct uh right now that's correct okay and then have you looked into the federal cares funding um and what's yes. what's happening with that Yes, we have. We've been doing a lot of looking into that. Uh, Marcy and I were on um, a phone call, a, a national phone call the other day with uh, Betsy uh, DeVos. So um, we will get 80% of our FY20 Title I uh, funding, and it, it will be about, is it 26,000, Marcy? 20, 20, about 26,000. Right. We don't get a lot of Title I uh, funding, um, so it is 80% of that. And they're being very um, generous on uh, how we can use that. Uh, I haven't seen the final guidelines, um, but the states right now are in the process of applying to the feds. And um, I, we, we were on that phone call last week and they said, the feds said they were tr going to try to do a three day turnaround to the states. We're waiting um, for the applications to come out for the grant so that we can uh, apply to the state of Maine. Um, so it is designed to help uh, school districts uh, recover any funding that they've spent on preparation for the pandemic and then moving forward supporting uh, students. Okay. But it's only about 26,000, so that doesn't go. It helps, we'll take anything we can get. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Councillor Adams. Thanks. Um, so I had just a, a general comment I wanted to make and then a specific question. Um, but my general comment is that in looking through this budget and the municipal budget, um, this year especially, I haven't really been looking at the two as distinct in terms of what we can do to reduce the effect on taxes, but um, I would like to see that the the tax rate increases marginally, if at all, um, this year, recognizing the hardship. And, and I do think we may have a little flexibility on the municipal side um, to work on that. But in terms of the school budget, I, I had a couple of questions and I'll just start with one for now so that we can all have a chance to talk. But I was wondering specifically um, about next year in the fall, it seems already like there are at least a few things that will not probably happen. One of which is um, students eating in the cafeteria um, in large groups, which seems challenging right now, especially for, for Pond Cove in the middle school. And um, like it's something that, that likely will not be happening in the fall. So is there any potential savings um, in that regard in terms of anticipatorily maybe cutting things that we know or we have a pretty good sense are just not gonna happen? So we still have to feed our students, um, of course. So we would be feeding them in the classrooms. Um, so if you're thinking of, uh, I'm not sure what you're thinking of um, staffing in the cafeteria maybe, but those people, we would have to deliver the food um, 
probably to classrooms. Um, we've I've talked a little bit to Peter about this, um, about how that might work. I guess we were thinking as we um, moved into the pandemic um, situation that we might have to do that before we left school, but um, it's, it, that didn't happen. Um, so I we would still be we would still be feeding students, so the the spending on food. Um, we're not sure if the um, national lunch uh, school lunch program waiver will still hold. Um, we're not sure how long that will hold. So um, you know whether we're getting funding for that uh, at the high school. Um, we don't know that yet, but we would still need the same staff. We would still need staffing to deliver to do, to make the food and to deliver the food. Uh, to the classrooms, so I, I don't anticipate any any savings in that area. Can I ask just a quick follow up? Sure. By all means. So, um, is there anything, even if it's a a small thing, um, that you can see that there might be a little bit of savings or room to reduce a position um, because we may be looking at distancing that requires having fewer students in spaces? Uh, that, I, I'm not sure how, spacing wise, how that would work because as, as you know, you probably heard us talk about the limited spacing that we have anyway, where some of, some of our schools and rooms are, um, are pretty crowded. So I am not sure how, how that would work and where we would put those bodies. Um, so I haven't really thought a lot about savings in that area, but I think that uh, that will be a challenge for us, space-wise. Councilor Straw. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, for um, Donna, um, first just a uh, question and then a, a, a uh, more detailed question. First question was with respect to the furloughing uh, issue. Um, my recollection is that the governor issued some executive order relating to like that restricted our ability with uh, hourly workers or something. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? And did that impact? Is that part of why we haven't furloughed some of the the hourly staff? Yeah, we're working within that those uh, guidelines. So yeah, uh, yeah. So I think uh, people should bear in mind that. We, we we don't unilaterally have the ability to do whatever we want. Or is that that fair? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Right. Um, so then, uh, my comments really, if pre-COVID, these are the things, uh, some of the things that I would have brought up with the budget. Um, but I realize with the situation we're in, um, there's arguments for why we should be doing this anyway. But this also then goes to uh, the difficulty I have with the paper copy we, we received of the budget. because So I can see what the various teacher staffing proposals and everything are for the various schools and the different grades uh, on your online budget website. Um, and I can see what the original proposals were back in January for the size of the classes from K all the way through 12, which is great because this is the first year I've been able to see the nine to 12. Um, and what I've always been looking for is did the school board uh, go through the processes of reviewing what the proposed class sizes are and uh, look and say, oh, does this adhere to our policy guidelines? And if it doesn't, uh, does the justification that we've been given justify um, per, uh, continuing with this, this class size? So that's always like one of the major things given that staffing is like the major cost center. That's the, one of the major process things I'm always looking for. And this is the first year where I can see that you guys did that all the way across the board. So, and again, this is pre-COVID. Uh, but looking at, say, Pond Cove, it looked to me, the original proposal, um, it looked like third and fourth grade were overstaffed by one teacher. So I'm curious, is that what, uh, did you guys stick with that staffing level, because I can't tell, or was that reduced, uh, increasing the class sizes, they still would have been within guidelines, even eliminating those two positions or shifting them to other grades. Uh, and then the same thing also applies to the high school. And, I, uh, and again, this is all pre-COVID, <laughs> pre-COVID, and I totally see why we actually uh, would need those bodies to help with uh, response to intervention at this point. So, um, but with the high school, uh, just so we're perfectly clear, um, yes, there are some teachers who are shouldering an excessive number of students, 
But what I loved about that spreadsheet is that it showed that there are a couple teachers who are not shouldering their fair share from my perspective, at least as an individual. Um, there's some, I, I shouldn't phrase it that way, I apologize uh, to those people. Um, Cause I, I'm sure they would say, well, trust me, I do. There's some, some there's, a, there's a disparity in student teacher load for some of the teachers. And I see some of it is related to the uh, Achievement Center. Um, and was there at least a discussion of the fact that those teachers are below the guidelines? And perhaps instead of staffing the Achievement Center with uh, teachers, it was uh, instead done with ed techs or something similar, because that type of approach would have reduced, by my count, a head count of about, I look like moving people around to bring everyone up to the appropriate or the policy guidelines, it looks like two or three more head count could have been reduced at the high school, that approach. But again, this is all pre-COVID. Now with COVID, I see how you're gonna need the additional staff for response to, uh, to intervention. Um, so the real question is, did you guys discuss this? Did you look at it? What were the final numbers you went with with Pond Cove and with the high school? And now in the, the COVID world, is it now like, yeah, we're gonna keep them at this point? So um, I don't have the numbers in front of me for Pond Cove exactly, but I can tell you that um, the the fourth the fourth grade class last year was small so we reduced if you remember we reduced the teacher um so um the the third grade going into fourth grade this year is larger so that's that extra teacher that we have in the budget um and i believe there's one other class uh there's one other configuration that we had to shift the teacher around from one grade to the other because of a larger class and a smaller class. So we did look at that. As far as the high school goes, um, we had a lengthy discussion, um, maybe two board workshops ago about um, the Achievement Center. And in, um, in looking at the extended learning position, um, we ended up having to, um, probably move our English teachers out of the Achievement Center and back into the classrooms for next year. Um, they, we're low on math anyway in the Achievement Center. There's not very much uh, support in math, if any, uh, this year in the Achievement Center anyway. We were hoping with um, an additional part-time math teacher that maybe that would be helped a little bit next year. But um, it, it's really, there's, they're still looking at their um, enrollment and their scheduling. Uh, for next year. So when that, when the dust settles on that, they'll have more of an idea. But um, in our discussions, um, it was, um, it was pretty evident that the achievement uh, support in, the Achievement Center support in English would be less than this year. Elizabeth, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I think you've covered it. We, we had pretty extensive discussion about that and in the positional cuts that we made, um, the focus has really been protecting classroom coverage, even though uh, the community and the school place a high value on the Achievement Center. But uh, going forward, there may be no teacher support in the Achievement Center at all, depending on how things shake out. It's not looking great for the Achievement Center. I think the only thing that we're able to ramp up at this time is um, peer tutoring. So um, we don't use ed techs for coverage in the Achievement Center is what I understand. And um, I hope Jeff Shedd forgives me if I've made a mistake, but <laughs> that's my recollection. Um, the, the, the person who is in charge of the Achievement Center is an ed tech. So the, uh, the coordinator of the Achievement Center. Penny, you're up. Okie doke. Um, I have multiple things, but I'll try to single thread through them. Um, number one, are all employees in the school under contract and part of a union? No. What positions are not contract? Um, so the, the people who work in, um, in the business office, except for Marcy, Marcy check me on this, except for Marcy are not contracted. Um, our extended learning vol slash volunteer uh, person who really works at the high school, but um, 
he is under the central office uh, line items uh, is not under contract. Uh, can't any anybody else that you can think of, Marcy? I think that's that's it. correct, Donna. Okay, You're and correct. that that position is slated to go away anyway, Donna. So yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, do you want me to keep going, Janie, or do you want somebody else to go? Um, you can go ahead. There's nobody else with their hand raised, um, so okay. go ahead. I, I do want to make a few comments at some point, but um, go ahead. Um, my other thing is, is that um, I think what challenges me is that um, if we were in a different world at this point in time, a different uh, reality, um, when I look at the, the budget, I, I go, you know, everybody has put in a ton of work and it's a great, and it's good work, solid work. But it's not, it's not the world we're living in. And so, and I have to do this uh, in my world, in my business, uh, because of what's going on in, um, in our current reality. And so what my constant tug is, uh, how I not uh, impact the, the students and the, and the children and the opportunity for education in Cape Elizabeth while at the same time looking at the challenges that people um, are, are going to have in their uh, households to make ends meet. And, and so I, I just call on you to, to come up with something that, uh, that really we're going to be in a in a whole different place six or eight months from now trying to figure out how we're going to cover um, expenses in our town. I, I really think we will be tightening our belt and I have the same questions on the municipal side and as Valerie Adams said I look at this as a as a whole picture um, and so I I really ask, and these may be nickel and diming type things, but I ask how imperative is it for the functioning of the school to um, have one, two, three custodial type positions? And I recognize some are going to support um, town buildings and some are going to um, support schools, but um, and Perry can comment to me if he wants. I think we've got to step it up. And that's what I say to my employees every day. I can't keep hiring people. We had to step it up. And um, I mean, we all got a job to do. And the good thing is you got a job. And, um, and where we're at at this point in time is that I have to tell you, if you push this envelope too far, there are going to be people, more people without jobs. So we either got to uh, step back and say, how do we overlay what is on the horizon and, um, and, and really cut into this um, budget that's being proposed in a way that doesn't impact um, students. And so I ask, do you need three positions? Um, I ask, um, can, can somebody who works at Thomas Memorial Library come over half time and work in the school? And I know we've had those conversations before in the past. Um, and where are the places that do not touch students that we can um, make some decisions at this point in time so we are not making those decisions six months from now because uh, if we don't make them now, we're going to make them later. So Penny, I just wanna jump in and Donna, before you give any answer, if you were going to at all, um, I totally respect uh, where you're coming from with the question, Penny, and, and don't disagree. Um, with the purpose that you're driving towards. What I, I just wanna sort of direct 
specifically for the purpose of this conversation, but generally um, as it relates you know, to my view of our role in this whole process is I don't think it's gonna be healthy tonight, um, particularly in so much as that we're not even voting on anything um, to, to use this time to go line item by line item and try and say, well, do you need this? You know, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so I, I, think, I think if we're generally expressing concern about the amount of budget request and, and relating that back to what we feel our role is um, to be looking after, uh, you know, the entire um, fiscal well-being of the town and, um, uh, uh, you know, representing the citizens and, and them as the taxpayers, I think I'd, I'd like to focus our conversation more in that realm versus, um, as, as you yourself just said, some of the nickel and dime stuff around line item, light item by line item, so. I will, I will say that um, sometimes you have to ask a detailed question in yep. order to highlight. Uh, high yeah, so if it's for the purpose of an example, yeah, if it's for the purpose of an example, I just don't, I, I don't think it's productive for any of us tonight, nor in, in some cases would it be considered our specific role um, to be saying, well, I think this should go or that should go. I think. I didn't say uh, that. No, I know. So I'm just, I, I, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers I, directly at you, I, but I just, I, I, I want I'm to prevent us from going down that path is what I'm saying. All so. I'm saying is that in order to express somebody's position on where we as a town as a whole need to be focusing our resources and those resources from my perspective is on the academic success of young people the safety of all of our citizens and ensuring that all the people in our town have the um, um, food and um, social services and all of those things in order to help people get through what we're experiencing right now. And so I apologize if it sounded like I was uh, saying uh, cut these positions, but my point is we're going to have to make some tough decisions to really get past this whole thing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not picking on you so much as I'm trying to proactively get ahead of this whole thread of conversation before we get too far down to where everybody's just cherry picking line items off the budget because that's not going to get us anywhere tonight, nor, nor frankly tonight does that need to be the outcome. So um, in any case, Councillor Adams. Um, I guess I wasn't going down that road precisely, but I, what I wanted to convey to the, to the school board and um, Donna is that I don't want to see the school budget cut to pieces so much that when you come back next year or the year after, or when things are turning around and it looks like a huge ask because you've had, to, which I feel like has happened in the past, you, you cut things that you really need. And then when you come back and ask for them, it looks like you're asking for too much. Um, I'd like to avoid that if at all possible at the same, and, and that's why I'm trying to focus a little more on the total budget increase town and school together um, and looking at what we can maybe work with on the municipal side so that we don't end up in that situation. But at the same time, I am hopeful that the, the school board could go back through, and I know that you did this and I have so much respect for all of you and all of the time you put in, but go back through again with a really fine tooth comb, looking at even minor expenses and are there things that can come out that are more of a want than a need? It's similar to what Penny is saying, I, I don't want things to impact the students and I really don't want the school to be slashing this budget to pieces so that you have to ask for a huge amount in the future. But are there places that can be cut in addition to what you've already looked at?
That was a question for Donna or? Um, it's not an immediate or, question. Oh, it's, okay. a, it's a put it on the radar question. Okay. I know that um, a comment was made last night about um, looking at the budget uh, in the light uh, and through the lens of what you need rather than what you want. Um, and I want everybody to know that we, we've taken this very seriously from the beginning and, um, and we have done that, um, really looking at what, what we need rather than, I mean, there were, there, were, uh, there were wants on here that are no longer here. So I just want everybody to know that, um, that we have examined it for needs versus wants and really gotten rid of the wants, so. And can I just clarify, Jamie? Go ahead. Um, I, I think what I'm also contemplating, and I don't know if you've done this and it's part of your process, but looking, not just looking at what you would like to add or would have liked to have added to the budget, but things that may be baked into the budget already that are sort of status quo that could be reexamined and considered, you know, is that something that, that this year maybe we can forego? And I'm, I'm really asking, can you be nitpicky with small ticket items if we can then on the town side maybe work on some more big ticket items to get the numbers down as much as possible? So if I may, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the exact work that the um, administrators and Donna do, but I know that what we do ask them to do is to not just roll things over, that we examine line by line programs that are already in existence to make sure that they're still doing what they're supposed to be doing. Are they giving us the bang for the buck? And there is at least one position that was in existence that is no longer in existence because it didn't function the way the the uh, administration really wanted it to. So um, I can't talk to um, or speak to the savings and that sort of thing, but I can say that part of the rigor of the process demands that we don't just look at what is added, but we look at what we already have and say, um, is it worth keeping? Is it working? Is it worth the money? Councilor Gabrielson. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a question which does relate to a, a line item, but it's a line item that's shared and I'm not, I'm going to be careful. I'd like to ask this in a way that looks at the operational impacts rather than the budget impacts per se. So um, I've had a couple of constituents ask me about the, the line item which is cur carried on the town side of the budget for supporting operations at the pool and wondering if there might be opportunities for um, savings to, to overall expenditures that we could be incurred there. I don't know what order of magnitude savings there are. I'm not asking you to guess that, um, but I, I do wonder um, if, since it is a shared facility uh, between the town and the pool, if that were one area where the town were looking to um, realize some, some reduced expenditures, uh, what would the operational impacts on that of that potentially be? Uh, say if the town were to recommend closing the pool for a certain period of time or something along those lines. I don't believe the pool is part of the school budget. Can someone correct me, please? Yeah, I don't, it's not a shared. Yeah, Matt, go ahead, Matt. It's a, yeah, it's part of the community services uh, operational budget. It started out, <laughs> coincidentally enough, it started out as a school expenditure and then over the years it transitioned into becoming a town, uh, a town operation. So, uh, but it is a community services, it's in the community services budget. Uh, so, and then there is, uh, sorry, yeah, Councilor Gaberson, if, I, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, yeah. uh, looking at the, you're interested in seeing if there's uh, potential for savings due to reduction uh, of hours, perhaps uh, on uh, staff side because uh, of uh, perhaps custodial staff on one end and then pool staff on the other uh, and in the maintenance of the facility? 
Um, that was the question that was posed to me. Um, and the, but I, I think more what I'm interested in is is not figuring out what that budget impact might be tonight because I you know I think there's a lot of questions that would need to be answered there. Um, more what I was asking was I'm aware that the school use makes use of that facility. It's co-located with the school. So if the town were to make some decisions around changing hours or availability of that resource operationally for the school department, um, what would those impacts be? That's more the more what I'm hoping to ascertain tonight rather than the actual potential for cost savings there. Yeah. If I may, uh, Councilor Garvin, uh, just mm -hmm. I'm thinking uh, that may take us a little bit of time to try to quantify, but I'm happy to uh, talk with Kathy about it because she'll have to work with Andrew, uh, who's our, our, our pool, uh, you know, our a pool guru or a pool manager uh, to look at the allocation for time uh, to, to answer that type of question. But that's something I think we can we can get back to for sure on. And, and if Donna doesn't have a, a ready answer on that, I realize it, I, you know, I'm coming out of the blue with it. But um, I, 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 before we even contemplate any decisions there, I'd just like to you know, have a, a response from the school department on what the impact of that might be. So are you thinking well it's been suggested it during school hours is that is that what you're asking that that's what a couple of folks have suggested is that you know maybe maybe people aren't going to want to go into a pool so why are we paying to keep it open um i, I i'm not sure i fully agree with that but I, i'm curious what the impact would be on the school end of the operation if we were to make changes in schedule or uh, opening hours things of that mm -hmm. nature okay. So you might be talking about, you know, gym classes that use the pool and then during perhaps swim season, the, the swim team, okay. Chris, go ahead. Uh, yep, uh, so uh, first off, uh, just, uh, I just wanted to clarify and apologize both to uh, Principal Shedd and those teachers that uh, do work in the Achievement Center. I didn't mean to discount in any way the, the important work they do do. I was just noting it, with the reflect to the student load and how can we reallocate the teacher teacher resources in order to lower the overall cost but i i didn't want to i didn't want to apologize to the extent i came across as uh, demeaning the work they do because i do recognize the value of it and i do recognize the importance of that program but I was just looking how can we save costs so that that aside um so for uh donna um and again not to get too much in the line items just one of the big jumps uh, here is also in the course reimbursements for the under the improvement of instruction. Uh, it's like five cents of the mill rate increase. Is that I is that uh, something that's just part of the contract and we're it, it is by? it is and um and are we even allowed to ask nicely that they maybe think about waiting a year to take the courses or or is, if they choose to we're contractually bound to provided we are contractually bound and some of those uh, some teachers need to take courses to keep their certifications in uh, place so. got it all right thanks um not seeing any other hands from counselors so i'm going to take the opportunity to jump in um sort of pull up a little bit from from the last half hour 45 minutes of discussion so the first thing is that um i'm i'm not hearing any counselor advocating for um, uh, recommending to put forward the budget as has been presented. Um, so unless there's somebody that hasn't spoken or has that opinion and just hasn't voiced it yet, um, uh, that seems to be number one, the consensus among the council. Um, number two, like I said um, in part of my remarks last night and I'll reiterate tonight, I think one of the you know fortunate things about um, uh, moving out the referendum vote is uh, the little bit of more time um, that we are able to buy ourselves um, in order to continue to work not only on the school budget, but I agree with the points that some of the other counselors have made um, about the municipal budget as well. Um, you know, I, I said this last night, I, I, I wanna reiterate it and, and, and make sure that it's not, um, I, I'm not just, I'm making platitudes here that, um, I think the discussion we're having and the hard decisions and dialogue uh, that are going to follow uh, in all likelihood on this um, should in no way, in my opinion, be a reflection of, um, you know, the work and effort and time that's been put in um, 
by all the folks that have been involved in putting together both budgets. Um, but I think, you know, as has obviously been stated, um, you know, not only is the current time uh, and the present moment that we're in dramatically different um, than when most of the work on these budgets was started uh, and carried forward, but even more importantly so, uh, the time that's ahead of us remains uh, tremendously uncertain. And, um, and, and so I think it's, it's all the more important that we continue to scrutinize both of the budgets um, appropriately so. Um, you know, from a personal perspective, I think the fundamental work that is being done by our schools uh, is as important now as it ever was, and, you know, probably even more so uh, given some of the current circumstances. But um, I personally have some really serious concerns about the assumptions that are being made in, uh, in the budgets, um, again, both the school and municipal budgets in terms of, you know, what are actual sources of revenue um, are going to be, what the amounts of those revenues are going to be, and ultimately what the impact of this emergency is going to be uh, on the ability to rely on our taxpayers as the primary source of raising those revenues is going to be. Um, so, um, you know, I think some of the discussion I've heard here tonight is sort of nibbling around the edges a little bit. And while it's important that, you know, any any penny found is a penny saved. I, I get that, but um, I, I would encourage us going forward as we look at this problem to really think um, around some some bolder and and more creative solutions um, that really meet the challenge of the time that we're facing. So the kind of discussion that I'm hearing tonight is the same kind of sort of budget nibbling that we would have been having last year, or that we might be having next year. God willing, if it's a more normal circumstance. But this is a really unique circumstance. And I don't think that that same kind of thinking is going to get us to any kind of solution that matches the magnitude of the problem that we're facing. Um, so one of the crazy, pardon my French wild ass ideas that I threw out to, to Matt earlier today um, was, you know, is, is there validity um, in approaching, you know, so in so much as that salaries and benefits are in both budgets, the lion's share of, of uh, the expense side of the equation. Um, is there validity in the idea of approaching the collective bargaining units to say, hey, we need to, we need to have a discussion with you all about, you know, coming up with a, a, a creative and shared sacrifice solution um, to, the, to the challenge before us? Um, I'm not asking or suggesting that anything should just be given away uh, or that any of those collective bargaining units are going to just out of the goodness of their heart um, say, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't, why don't we do that? Um, but if we have multi-year contracts uh, that we could somehow creatively come to an agreement on where any um, increase in salary that was anticipated or built into those contracts for this year, gets frozen at last year's rates and somehow is made whole across remaining years of the contract, or maybe in some cases, an additional year of a contract being tacked onto. I think that is the kind of big and bold and, and creative thinking that we should be looking at for this moment. Um, and to say, okay, you know, the, the one thing that I hear about when, when people say, oh, we need to flat, you know, um, flat increase or, you know, whatever, the phrase, you know, flat, flat budget from last year, um, you know, I think, I think most of those people and certainly everybody else that's participating in this meeting is well aware that even just to do that, even if you had just last year's plan and just last year's budget rolled into this year, the built-in costs uh, that, that, uh, that are part of that um, prevent you from even just rolling, rolling that plan over and have it cost the same. Uh, so you're already, before you even think about adding anything new, you're, you're looking at needing to, to reduce expenses in some area in, in, in all likelihood reduce positions in order to ach achieve just that flatness. So what I'm trying to think of is a way to reduce that expense burden creatively. Um, so that's one idea. I have no idea if it'll fly. I think it's worth exploring uh, and I think it's worth having a discussion around. 
Um, but it's, it's that type of thing that I would hope um, would be um, in line with and, and uh, appropriate to the moment that we're facing. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there for a minute. Um, Chris. Um, when does the teacher contract expire? If I recall from the presentation last night, they've reached agreement, but neither side has ratified and feel free anybody from the school board or superintendent's office to elaborate on that. That's correct. The current teacher's contract um, expires at the end of the fiscal year. And so that would be um, the new contract taking effect July 1st. Once we are supposed to, we're hopefully ratifying uh, they, the, the um, sorry. The association needs to ratify and the uh, board is hopefully going to approve on uh, our May business meeting agenda. And I, I, I want to be clear, just in case I was, I'm not, I'm not talking about just the teachers union. I'm talking about all collectively bargained contracts. Um, as Councilor Adams has said, and I've heard a few other counselors say, I, I'm looking at a collective, mm -hmm. a collective, uh, challenge and a collective conundrum around um, how do we provide necessary services uh, in a way that is absolutely least impactful to the taxpayers um, and is commensurate with um, the very, very unique challenge that we're facing. Um, you know, one of the things I, I sat on the Maine Municipal Association's workshop today um, that uh, was led by a couple of town managers, one from Biddeford, one from Brunswick, and a few folks from the MMA. I'm um, just talking about, you know, the challenge of budgeting in this time. And um, uh, it, it was, uh, it resonated with me a point that was made um, where unlike, they, they were doing a lot of comparative look at uh, 1991, 92 timeframe, uh, 2008, 2009 time, timeframe um, that were, um, uh, you know, had to do with uh, previous downturns in the economy and and what the the sort of uh, trough looked like before it rebounded and from what I've been reading from economic uh, uh, news coverage and, and listening to um, experts sort of opine on this well while we don't know the extent to which how long this will last most everybody that um, that I've been reading and listening to feels that that trough will not be as long or drawn out um, as was with previous economic times of times of economic hardship that the economy was 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 humming um, and that this is not related to a systemic failure or fault in the economy but an external factor um, that is driving the current situation that we're in and so that's what got me thinking about how can we how can we spread out? How can we, you know, to, to borrow the term from the, from the virus itself, how can we flatten the curve about the economic impact um, that, that uh, it's, instead of taking one big economic hit uh, right now, how can we spread that out and diffuse and defer that a little bit? So um, there may be other ways to accomplish that. There may be other ideas that people have. Um, I'm certainly open to them, but that's, that's one that I had. So Councilor Jordan, uh, Penny Jordan. I quickly follow up on that? Sure, go ahead. And then I was just, and then the reason I mentioned the teachers, the two big ones are public works and teacher, if I recall correctly. And I think public works we recently ratified in the last two years. So we've got another year or two on that one. But your, I guess, Jamie, your point is perhaps approaching uh, a, any of the unions to the extent we can to ask it, would you be willing to renegotiate in a way that still gives you the benefits but pushes it out past the end of this economic upheaval? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So um, just to, to, to whiteboard the example, Chris, you know, if you've got a three year contract, uh, you know, do you, do you spread whatever um, step gain was was, in, you know, included in this year's across the remaining two years, if you've only got one year remaining, you know, is that collective bargaining unit interested, given the uncertain times ahead in probably the next, you know, six to 12 months of locking in an extra year or two now um, 
you know, in exchange uh, for, for trading the short-term gain that, that they would have otherwise realized. So, um, yep, uh, Penny. Uh, first of all, Jamie, I want to say excellent, excellent, excellent idea. Um, it, it's something that I pondered but didn't take the risk to ask. I am so always happy that you bring forward those things. Oh, you let me walk out on the, on the tree branch. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm not going to cut it off, though. <laughs> I, I'll come with you. I, right. I, we, I love the way, because it is, and I kept thinking, how do we make some bold moves? We need bold moves. We don't need the, the same old, same old. So I thank you. Thank you for bringing this up, and I would love it if what we can do is uh, go out on that branch together, and uh, hopefully Matt won't saw it off, but uh, thank you very, very much. Councilor Devereaux. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. I, I was, uh, Matt and I were on that same call, uh, the webinar with you, and um, it was really an eye-opener hearing the um, two town managers talk about um, how they've lived through the different downturns and how different this one is. And I, I think it's really imperative that, um, that we look at our options and we make, we're gonna have to make painful and unpopular budget um, choices because we really don't know, we don't have any idea what the impact of this is gonna be. Um, just some of the, um, just, just a couple um, numbers here in 2008 the national debt was 10 trillion right now it's 24 trillion and counting um, in 2008 un unemployment was 5.8 percent right now it's 20.2 percent um, and counting so um, I think we need to prepare for the worst and um, if everything does get up running quickly then um, hallelujah if it doesn't at least we're we're prepared and I really um, appreciate all the work everybody's done on this budget. But I just don't think that 5.95% um, increase is, um, is appropriate right now. But I think we all can work together and be creative. Um, and I think we owe it um, to our town to act responsibly and be responsible with both budgets because we just don't know what's gonna happen. And as they pointed out, um, our revenue streams just our excise taxes aren't going to be the same. Our, the money coming in from the state is not going to be the same. And the school budget has uh, a lot of that state money in there as revenue. And if we get zero, and I believe it was 1.4 million, if we don't get that 1.4 million from the state, that's going to create a lot of problems right there. So, um, I hope that we can be creative and figure ways to to reduce this so we're not scrambling um, sometime next year. Jeremy? Um, I see Heather also has her, oh, um, has her hand up. I don't, you, do you want me to go first and then maybe move to her? Uh, yours was the only one I saw, but. Oh, okay. She had her physical. Uh, um, oh, uh, sorry. I, I've been going uh, off of the, the List you know, in the, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I, I guess I, just to build on the, the idea of us all being in this together and, and looking back at some historical examples, um, one thing that I would note, recognizing that there's no perfect historical analogy, was that back in the 08-09 crisis, um, the, uh, I think it was the fiscal year 10 budget that was adopted kind of right at the low point of the economy. Um, there was a, a slight reduction in overall municipal expenditures in that budget. Within that budget, though, it was reduced expenditures by the town, reduced expenditures by the county, and a slight increase in the school budget. So even though the overall expense numbers went down, the school budget did slightly increase at that time frame. I don't know, you know exactly where the right mix is, but that, I'm kind of I'm looking at that the ability of the town to help cushion some of this by deferring expenses is a strategy um, that, that I'd like to see us pursue. Yeah, and at this point, and I'll come to you in a second, Heather, I, I, I wanna be, I'm not advocating specifically for flat 
budget or on, in, in, on either side. Um, what I, what I am advocating for is, um, like I said, I think, um, bold thinking, but also an overall, you know, like, like Councilor Adams said, I, I, I'm looking at the total net impact to the taxpayer and having that be as minimal as possible, um, across the board. So, um, so if, you know, if somehow we were able to do what I've suggested, you know, does that allow that that may in fact allow for some of the asks that have been made um, that, um, you know, in the opinion of the school board, um, our, our needs, not wants and, and, you know, programs that or positions that are justified um, based on certain uh, enrollment changes in, in certain buildings. So I, I, I don't, if we were to use something like this and, and, and creatively come up with that savings on the expense side, that's not to say that, you know, in my opinion, it doesn't mean that nothing new could happen or be added. Um, but it's, it's what is all of that? What's the collective total impact of that to, to reduce to as minimal as possible uh, the impact to the taxpayer? Heather, what would you like to say? Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what Valerie was commenting on. And if we lose the money from the state subsidy and we're asked to cut back our budget, that's like a double whammy. And our schools will not look the way we all know them to look. They, we are talking to lose that much money and then to be asked to cut it back more, we are losing teachers, we are losing positions, we are increasing class sizes. We are not taking care of the students in this, um, in this district, in this school. And so um, I, I, I hear what everyone is saying about trying to find the balance and the responsibility to taxpayers, but we have so much responsibility to these kiddos and to provide for them their, their education, their future. I wanna reiterate, what Chris Straw was saying last night, their, their future is at stake right here. Nobody is learning at the, the same pace or the same ability right now than they ever have. Kids um, are learning at a different pace, different falling through the cracks. And the unknowns of that is there. And if we cut back more on the budget with the potential of the state cutting back as well, it's gonna be devastating. And it, you know, you say you don't want the impact on these kids, well, then follow through because there will be an impact on these kids. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. I can tell you I have worked under and on a um, school board member under three, um, three superintendents. And this is true what Donna says. These are not wants. These are haves. And the haves are not just, um, the haves are not just academics. The haves are the cleanliness so that they don't get sick and we don't have another pandemic and they don't have to be sent home. The haves are the emotional well-being. The haves are the sports, which create well-rounded beings in this time. So it, it's not a linear way to think of just math, science, history, English, and, and maybe foreign language for some folks. Um, so we just need to be able to have flexibility. Last night, there was a big ask that I kept hearing about, well, what will it look like? How, it, how are things going to look in the fall? And can you come up with certain scenarios? The problem is, is that we don't know what those scenarios are. And if the money is cut back so much between um, the ask from the town council and the state, there's going to be no flexibility to come up with another plan. And uh, I, I'm just telling you, it, the, these schools are not going to be the same. They're not going to be what the parents in this district have been asking for. And so I hear that there is a strong concern about taxpayers. Um, it's a 2.27 overall tax impact. Um, I urge you, I urge you not to take that out of the schools. Donna, we looked at this again last week. Yes, we started the process in January, but we looked at it again last week and we're still supporting it. There are, there have been lots cut out. So, thank you. Um, Chris, before I come to you, just Heather in response, I think that's, that's really behind, I think what I'm suggesting and 
you know, again, I have no idea if it would work, um, but is a way to potentially, you know, have cake and eat it too um, yeah. from the standpoint of not looking to make cuts now, but looking to spread out that, that pain and that impact. So, so I'm just, can, can I respond to that for a yeah. second, Jamie? I, I'm not responding to that. I think that's a creative yeah. way to work outside the box. We have no control out of, of that. I, mm -hmm. I suppose, and maybe Donna or Elizabeth who, or Hope who have done negotiations or Phil, um, like that cannot come from us. Perhaps we can go the bargaining group and ask to consider it, but I don't even know if if that's a possibility. But, but my fear, Jamie, is that the town council comes to us, says we want this cut with the hopes that that will happen. And that's totally out of our control. And um, so I don't, I don't know if Donna or Elizabeth wants it. Wants, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, or not. You don't have to either. But I just, I, that's, that's not a guarantee. And I, and I would, I would be nervous about the town council asking. I, I like the idea. I encourage the exploration of it. Perhaps if it's even a possibility, I, I am hesitant about. Um, the town council asking to lower the budget with that being the idea of how it would be lowered because I'm not sure it's possible and I'm not sure it would fly. Well, I think right. some of these things might just have to be ticked off in a step one, step two fashion, right? So if something like that could happen, okay, let's go down, let's open that door and go down that path. If it's, if it's not possible, then we come back to the whiteboard again and figure out, well, what, what else can we do? Um, but um, number one, we won't know if we don't ask. Uh, and, you know, at least on the municipal side, the conversation I had with Matt today, um, it sounded like it was a fairly straightforward initial outreach to the heads of, you know, a couple of the collective bargaining units to say, hey, this is an idea that the council has come up with, you know, are you guys even willing to, to entertain the discussion? And if the answer is no, okay, then we're in a different position. If the answer is yes, then Maybe we're in the position of doing some quick work to, to figure that out. I don't know. Um, it's again why I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, the extra 30 or 40 days we might have here instead of, you know, having to make this decision in a week or two. So, Chris? Uh, yeah, so to just put a bow on that, uh, it's basically if, if our relationships with all of our employees is, uh, is good and we've all worked collegially and collaboratively and respectfully, I'll make numbers up. Let's say, a con let's say the public works contract or um, uh, the, I'll call it the pipe fitter union. I don't know. We'll make up the pipe fitter union. Maybe, suppose we have a contract with them where it's, uh, they're supposed to get 2% this year uh, and we instead say, oh, how about you make it 1% or 0% this year, and next year, instead of the two you're supposed to get, you get four or something like that. So it's, it's like uh, refinancing your mortgage in a way, where you're, you're, the, the overall amount is still the same. You're just shifting things. I guess that, that's how I'm imagining what you're proposing. I, I don't want to get into, you know, sort of an open session here, getting oh, into yeah, negotiating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but conceptually, one. Yeah, I was just yeah, conceptually, conceptually, you're trading, you're trading, you know, one thing now for something later is exactly. the idea and, yeah, yeah. and what that looks like and whether or not it's a straight one for one trade or yeah. it's, you know, something else. I don't know. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we will, we would need to be careful in this regard so that we're not as Councillor Adams suggested, you know, in reference to things that could get cut out of this budget, you know, well, if those things just appear back next year and all of a sudden we've got a, a massive leap, year over year, then, then that's not really helping necessarily anything either. So it's, it's again, more kind of spreading out versus, you know, just totally, you know, punting from one year to the next, I would hope. But anyway, Matt, did you want to add to that or? Uh, just to, to add uh, information to the discussion is that both of our uh, collective bargaining agreements are expiring next July, uh, next June 30th. So we're in the third year of the three-year contract at the present time. So, uh, you know, we will we will approach uh, both both unions to uh, see what their thoughts are as far as an extension. But uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I think, you know, what, what Chris has brought up forward for a point, and what uh, and and then Jamie, I think you completely accurately uh, bring to the conclusion of the fact that yeah, uh, what are you accomplishing if 
uh, you do extend it by a year or two, but it costs you uh, more in the long run if you just pushed it out out a year or so. But it's a uh, but it's definitely worth the conversation, I think, in going there. And we're in different situations from where the school is because they're at the process of just completing and uh, extensions or renewals of their of their CBAs. So, uh, but it's you know, we're willing to explore any any option that the town uh, wants us to go into for sure. And and I had uh, wanted to take us in a different direction. We've been there. There's two things going on at play here. Uh, there are two things at play here. There's um, the expenses, and then there's the uh, the cost to the, the the taxpayers. And normally those are very closely tied together. Um, and I, I do want to try to at least for the time being decouple those two in the sense with on the normally what a municipality, from my perspective, a municipality or a state or federal government does is they have a rainy day fund, which is my understanding is we have that at the state level. And wh what happens is when the rainy day comes, you draw from the rainy day fund. Um, we haven't really, from my perspective, discussed that on the municipal side of things. Normally, my approach is that the, uh, the general fund should only be used uh, to pay for capital improvements, things that uh, go over a long period of time. But uh, I am curious about us moving into a discussion about is this a day to draw down from the rainy day fund in order to, and this goes to the revenue side of things, raising the revenue from property tax bills as opposed to cutting expenses. And I understand there's a, a vocal segment of town uh, that really wants to focus on cutting the expenses. But I do want us to at least shift gears and talk about the revenue component. Do we, uh, is there any appetite? Is, uh, do we have the ability to basically pull from that rainy day fund to decrease the, um, the municipal tax hit on the municipal side of the equation uh, so that the overall tax hit is uh, equivalent to what it is this year? Matt and maybe John, do you each want to address that? And maybe then Donna from the school side, but. Yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, if, uh, looking at Councillor Straw's question, yes, we are looking at, we are using in this year's budget, at least some of the unassigned fund balance that we do have in order to help us meet some capital needs. And uh, and that's one, use of our, one primary use of those funds. Uh, we will find some savings in this year's budget that uh, you know, speaking with John Q about it, uh, those those savings end up falling into unassigned fund balance at the end of the year post audit, as Marcy had talked about as well on the school side, uh, where there may be savings that will find out, you know, will fall their way to the to the unassigned fund balance. So, um, one potential could be if we do identify uh, savings that we will find in the current year's budget, that we can identify that we'll be using those uh, you know, those unassigned. Well, basically using those savings as they fall to unassigned funds towards a uh, reduction of this year's tax increase. So I, I think there's potential there. It's not, it's not a silver bullet that's going to cure, cure the entire uh, uh, math problem, but it, 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 it could be a tool to help offset if, if the goal was to say, save, uh, you know, flatten the, the town's impact up to zero, we could probably accomplish it that way. And I, I just want to clarify on that. So um, you'll recall in the last year or two, we had reached the point where the, uh, the uh, fund balance had exceeded our guidelines of what we wanted. And yes. we were looking at capital expenditures uh, in order to draw it down. And I had expressed at that time that I preferred focusing on long-term capital expenditures rather than doing it as a rebate back to the taxpayers. So what I'm saying is I'm totally down with doing it as a rebate to the taxpayers at this point instead. Um, and taking one or two million of that excess amount and using it to directly just reduce the tax rate on the municipal side this year. Um, I see Kim Carr's hand raised. We'll go to you, Kim. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just uh, going back to what we were commenting on earlier with the negotiations, um, trying to extend out um, contracts or um, in increases. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I welcome any creative idea. Um, I think it just, I, I think you, you know, you all just touched on this, but I, I think it just, um, we've been in, in great, financial times as a country and our budget in town was not um, 
I, you know, I don't think, I didn't feel like things were flourishing. Um, so I hate the idea of um, having further increases um, on our personnel line next year or the year after when likely we're also gonna have, you know, facilities issues. And um, I, I think likely we'll just end up um, at pushing our problems to next year and having you know much greater uh, tax increases then, um, and you know I, I recognize we're in a, a really tough time now, and hopefully things will improve. But having been in great times, um, people still don't want their taxes increased. Um, you know, so I think we we want to be cautious how we approach that. Yeah, Kim, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, my response to that is just that um, there will every year, no matter, as you say, no matter what the circumstances are, people that don't want their taxes to go up, none of us want our taxes to go up. You know, that's, you know, that's a given, right? But what concerns me most about the current situation is the complete um, upheaval on the revenue side. And so even in the good times, at least we can count on the fact that you know, certain revenues are there and we know that they'll be there and state aid as low as it might be, we can feel solid about the fact that it's going to get delivered. Sitting here today, I have zero confidence that that aid is going to come through. I have zero confidence that the uh, revenue sharing on the municipal side is going to come through. So, um, you know, we've seen, you know, a huge impact on the excise and, and other, you know, uh, non-property tax uh, related uh, line items. And so just the, the complete lack of clarity about where the where those revenues are actually going to, you know, manifest is is what gives me the the pause to say, well, you know, at least at least in quote unquote normal times, you know, those are at least pretty well understood. And then you're just having a normal conversation around, you know, well, how much is how much is reasonable here and, and so on. But for right now, it just, it's so, so much more dire about not knowing where those are actually going to come from. Couple it with that with the fact that the, the people who are the source of paying for our primary source of revenue in this community have been so directly impacted. People who, you know, have either had impacts to their job or had their businesses closed and things like that, that, I, you know, we, we didn't really see much of an impact on the April 15th or April 1st, whatever, whatever the April 1st property tax, um, you know, uh, delivery from folks. But in other meetings I've been in regionally, everybody is really concerned about what's going to happen in October when that second tax bill comes. And are we going to see a lot of late payments? Are we going to see a lot of defaults at that point? Um, so um, again, I'm trying to project out forward to, you know, all these holes I see in the revenue side and without being able to really do anything about that, revenue picture, um, you know, what can we do to at least stabilize or, or neutralize, as I guess a better word, neutralize um, the expense impact. And, you know, the fact that the buses aren't running, fine. The fact that, you know, coaches aren't picking up their stipends for a full season, you know, that's great, but that's, that's you know, that's coin change, you know, in the scheme of things. Um, and the place where I see the possibility of, you know, truly making a dent in the problem is, is bigger picture like this. So, and in a way that, you know, I, I'm trying to think of this in a way that preserves the core of what on both the municipal and the school side is being asked for, for delivery of services too. Um, Cause I, I don't think that, you know, Matt or Donna or the staff under them have, have made, requests that they don't feel that they need you know everybody can judge that on it on their merits and things like that but um you know so you know how how can we figure out a way to creatively problem solve here is what i'm trying to think of um nasser and then penny hi good evening um i've been in and out uh, it is ramadan for us so Around 7.30, I had to eat. Um, from sunrise to sunset, we do not eat or drink. Uh, and it's a very holy month for us. And it's a month of sacrifice, sacrificing a lot of things during the day, something that you love, you give up. 
and it's also the month of giving. And so I'm going to talk about in reference to that. Yes, they, we do need to think of creativity and we do need to think about sacrifices. If we are asking the teachers to uh, sacrifice, we should equally ask uh, the citizens uh, of the town to sacrifice as well by paying more taxes as well. So I'm just going to give you my example. And again, it may work, it may not work. Uh, so I work for the city of Portland and uh, I'm an employee. And if I were to be asked uh, by the councils over there or the, the, the city manager saying that we are in, we are in crisis and uh, uh, NASA or X amount of staff will ask first, first ask to volunteer. Those who are willing to volunteer to sacrifice uh, one paycheck of, of, their, of their salary, just one week, and, and uh, that paycheck can be compensated via uh, vacation pay later in the year, so via sick pay, or it, may not be sacri or it may not be compensated at all. So we need to find out what, the, what thinking like this, if each teacher and each staff sacrifice their one week check, what will the budget look like? And at the same time, the, the other town staff have to sacrifice equally along with the citizens who are paying taxes too. So that's just my idea. I think uh, creativity is important. These are the times we have to do a lot of creativity. I agree with that. Uh, and uh, so the, t the question is that we got to think about it uh, equally across everybody. Uh, a lot of the teachers may not live here. They may not have kids in the school system and they will be doing the more sacrifices and they are already doing a lot of sacrifices for all of our students. And so we have to remember that as well. Thank you. Penny, back over to you. Um, just a general question. I, I believe this is a truism, but um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. It's my understanding that, um, say for example, um, the budget moves forward with the assumption that the school is getting X dollars from, uh, from the state. Um, if that then goes and gets approved, we, the town, even if the state um, cannot send all of that money, uh, we have committed to that budget and as a town need to um, honor all of those numbers. Isn't that how it works? Once that, once that is ratified, we're committed to that, whether the money comes from the state or not. Um, I'm gonna try to explain and make sure, and I'm gonna have Donna make sure that I'm correct. Um, we have to, uh, we have to vote to raise a certain amount of money above what the state is going to send us. So if the, the, the state doesn't send us whatever money that they have projected they will be able to, that's on us. We have to have the flexibility within our budget to somehow do without it. I, I'll refer to Donna, but I don't believe that that burden gets t passed on to the taxpayers. I've not operated in a curtailment in a municipality, and um, I'm imagining that it works fairly the same in RSU, but it, it was up to the school to, to assume the burden. So we had, to, we had to deal with the shortfalls within the school district. Thank you. Um, are there other points of view that haven't been heard or comments that want to be made? Um, and if there are, great, but if there aren't, I want to try and move us into where do we go to move forward from here? Jamie, I'm raising my hand physically because oh, I am actually okay. a decent user of Zoom, but because of my setup, I actually don't have a raise hand feature. So Sure, we'll yeah. just pipe up then. Okay. <laughs> So I'm looking at the most recent pro forma from today. And my question is, um, it looks like the updated 
um, local assessment has been factored in, which lowered the school side tax impact to 3.79%, if I'm not mistaken. And it lowered the, um, the town and the, like anybody cares, we all care about the combined tax rate which is the total impact. So it looks like that has been lowered to 1.98%. Yep, and I think I, I had asked Matt for clarity that the school, the, the numbers feeding the, the school portion of that still include an assumption of the full amount of state funding, is my understanding. Um, which I as don't of, imagine. Uh, which this, at, yeah, as our I've tax said, rate wouldn't change because we have to assume that burden is what I, I mean, that's what I've always understood. I have worked, I have worked through a curtailment before here. Right. But what I'm saying is if, if we get the full amount, great, but should we be going in right now planning to receive the full amount? I'm not sure okay. that that's smart. I see your point. I thought you were saying that our tax rate might yeah. be affected. Gotcha. Nope. And, and gotcha. in the same manner. So, so if you, if you pulled at least a portion of it out right now, it would have, it would raise that tax impact for the time being. Um, just in the same, Matt has already reduced the the expectation. Uh, I don't think he's eliminated it. Matt, chime in. I don't, I don't think you eliminated it. You took it down a certain you know percent, right? Yeah, if, if, if I may, uh, on the town side of it, in the second version of the budget that I submitted to council, uh, we had reduced the uh, uh, anticipated state revenue sharing uh, by 15% from what they had provided for their initial uh, amounts, which was uh, which is consistent with what the uh, workshop that we were at today had uh, seen historically taken place, and then uh, and then on the excise tax side of it, I reduced that by 10% uh, from what we had originally anticipated, uh, which would be closer to actuals than what we have. So I built that into our current uh, into our current revenue estimates that are that are live, and then we're in that second budget that was provided to council. So the point I think I hear you getting at, Elizabeth, though, is that there's already been a lot of good work to, to reduce that number down. Um, so that That's there may not be as much. Is. Yep. Yeah. And, and there may, but to, so I guess my, my response that, so there may not be that much, um, you know, in a potential give back, uh, if we were to try and go down that path, um, that we would need you know, need to try and negotiate with, with anybody. But, um, you know, there's a part of me also that feels as if um, there's more to it than just balancing those numbers right now too. And um, that there's, there's an element of, uh, like I said, um, shared and community sacrifice um, that's commensurate with the time that we're in um, that, that I think, is a, is a small part of it for me too. Um, and, and feeling like, um, you know, everybody's got skin in the game in some, in some way. So other comments, discussion. Um, so a couple of things. Um, so the first off is, um, the the council um, needs to take action formally, correct, Matt, to actually move out the the referendum, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, in order to set the vote for Ju uh, July fourteenth, uh, the council will have an order on the. Uh, and Debbie, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that'll be on the on the fourth uh, to set that date, or will that be on the eleventh uh, for the council to set that date? Um, I guess we'd have to talk about that um, if we don't get any news that um, the council would otherwise be adopting the budget. So we might need a little bit more time for it to come to you on the 11th, but you would be asked to uh, sign the election warrant. Um, and again, that would either be on uh, next Monday's or the regular meeting on May 11th. Yep, but the council will to, to set it for order. to set it for the 14th of July. Yes. Correct. Right. Okay. If, and and in doing so, we would similarly vote to set a public hearing for the um, school budget for the fifteenth of June. Then, correct? Correct. Yes. Yep. 
Okay. Um, I do have a question about the timing of the municipal budget, which we're still currently scheduled to have a public hearing on next Monday and vote on um, on the 11th. Um, can you remind me and everybody else, if they're not aware, what's binding us to those dates? Oh, let's see. We're looking at the at the charter and the adoption of the budget, and uh, let's see. Just a moment, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, Article Five on the budget, Section Three, uh, from the date of the adoption of the budget, which adoption shall be no later than thirty days prior to the first day of the budget year. And that's uh, that would be July one. So we could push that out a couple of weeks if we wanted to have a special meeting. The, the, the point I'm getting to is is if we think we need to buy some more time, we could we could conceivably do that on the town side as well. Conceivably, and if uh, the one thing, uh, you know, if that was the council, and if you don't mind me, just uh, mm -hmm. uh, please for a moment. Thinking about this, if the council wanted to, it may be wise then to perhaps set the uh, the public hearing for the 11th for the town council budget and then perhaps move that a couple weeks further out if that was you know towards the end of the end of the month of may uh and then you could you know you could buy yourself a little bit of time because yep. you know that's be, exactly be, where i was going yeah i'm just i'm just thinking uh the big challenge is you know federally there's this you know, cares for that may be coming forward, and that may answer multiple questions on all different facets of everything that you guys are working on tonight. You know, from state yep. education expenditures or state aid, uh, you know, things that are going to close the gap on multiple ways. And you know, so you may have some answers. I guess uh, this is my uh, long-winded after two nights way of saying you may have a lot of answers that develop in the next thirty days uh, or the next, let's say, twenty. 20 days that uh, you at least have a direction, at least a better direction where we are right now. Because right now, you know, we're taking 15% off, uh, you know, out of our out of our revenue sharing. We're reducing our excise taxes. We're going to start reopening again just shortly thereafter that time period. To, and so those those revenue pictures may become better. But there's a lot of variables that I think may may come to shape. And other towns. I was on a meeting with Cumberland County managers this morning. And uh, I know Falmouth has pushed theirs out a couple of weeks. So there are other towns that are doing the same action as what you're con contemplating here as well. And then the, to, the add, to add the final wrinkle to it is that uh, uh, I know the governor is receiving a great deal of input relating to the adoption of, of school budgets across the, across the state, looking with the challenge of having a vote uh, in, 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 in RSU, RSU districts where you have to have district meetings and right, how can right. you actually do that uh, by Zoom and uh, being it. So there's some way, you know, they're looking at ways to have adoption take place either at the council level or by select boards or different ways. So a lot of that may take shape over the next over the next month as well. I anticipate it too, at least. Well, the point I've made repeatedly over the last two evenings is that there's certainly, um, I don't think any downside to waiting as long as we can to take these actions um, and, and hopefully only upside as it relates to um, bringing any degree of clarity more than we have today to any of these unknown variables. So, um, you know, the more known quantities that we can be working with um, as we make final decisions, I think, you know, we'll, we'll have much better decisions for that. Um, so I would strongly advocate for for doing that, uh, pushing out um, you know as much as we reasonably can. We're certainly meeting at a more regular interval than just our regular monthly meetings anyway. So I, I, you know I, I don't think it's in any way a burden on the council to have those extra meetings. Um, and then if if that's the direction we take, um, I'd like us to look at um, you know having some continued. Um, uh, joint finance subcommittee meetings and um, you know frankly Matt just some some discussions probably with you and Donna um, 
you know, around some of the things that have been put on the table tonight or any other ideas that might be out there um, beyond, beyond what we might have thought of already. But um, so I don't know if others are in agreement with that, uh, if there's broad consensus to go forward in that direction or if folks have other ideas. I'm in favor of, of buying ourselves a little bit of time. Um, I think, as you've pointed out, I think we only stand to gain by, by putting, that, putting that off, uh, you know, a, a few weeks if we can do that. I agree. I do as well. It's the smartest thing to do. We'll have more information every day. Yeah, I, hopefully I, it's good. Hopefully it's good news too. <laughs> you know, yeah. but even if even if it's bad news, it's better to know than not. So, right. Valerie Devereaux, did I step on your comment there? No, I'm just saying I agree definitely. Okay. Um. I do want to um, I do want to go back to uh, if, if there's if there's no more comments from counselors or no no more comments from anybody on the school board side. Um, I do want to allow some time for public comment here before we return to our regular meeting. Um, Jamie, if I may. Uh, yep, go ahead. Um, I would just like to um, again thank the town council, even though these are difficult discussions, I feel like we are really taking a collaborative cooperative approach. Um, I feel like we are, you know, working toward a common goal to try to, you know, ease whatever um, difficulty our, our taxpayers and we all sitting here on this call are taxpayers. Um, but I really appreciate that. Um, I feel like there's a lot of respect here among this group. I feel like um, we're working well together and um, I know that we'll be able to find solutions and I thank the council for um, the tone, the way we're working together and our common goals to serve our students and serve all of our community members. Thank you. I appreciate and concur with your sentiment there. Um, was there anybody else from the council or school board that wanted to offer any comment? Um, seeing none, uh, if there's anybody from the public that wishes to have any, um, any comment offered, um, there was earlier, I met somebody was texting me that they were having trouble with the, the raise hand function, that it was not appearing for them or, or not. I, I'm seeing it on my screen, so I don't, I don't know if anybody else in the public is having the same same challenge, but because um, I'm I'm not seeing anybody raising their hands, which is a bit of a surprise to me, to be honest with you. We have. Oh, uh, I Suzanne. see. Yep. yep, I see Susanna Mieselhub. So, when Matt gets you mic'd, go ahead, Susanna, and just a second. Okay. Hello. You're live. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everybody, for another long and important meeting. Um, <laughs> I just want to say, while I respect, uh, truly respect everyone moving slowly and respect all the um, concerns that have been shared, I just wanted to uh, provide one more perspective um, that I wanted to, that came to me while, Jamie, you said, you know, everybody's got skin in the game. Um, I just wanted to say that everyone does have skin in the game. And thus far, I feel the students and the teachers have already given a lot of skin. Um, in, in my mind, the entire school department is essential to our town's well-being, and the services offered to our students is as essential as the nurses, doctors, grocers, and everybody who has thus far been putting their, their lives on hold and their lives at risk um, for the good of all of us um, throughout this crisis. Um, the well-being of our children is essential in so many ways, and how much more skin do we really want them to share? That's my perspective I want to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, next is Jessica Butzel. Um, Matt, we'll queue you up in just a second. You should be good, Jessica. Oops, sorry. Now you should oh, be I'm good. Muted. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? 
Yes. yes, go ahead. Okay, awesome. First of all, thank. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for all the hard work that you're doing on behalf of the students and the town itself. I'm super grateful for everything that you all do. Um, I just wanted to voice uh, my opinion that um, I'm in strong support of the budget as it is, the school budget that's been advocated. And it's my understanding that the school board worked really hard already to trim it as much as they possibly could. And um, my perspective comes from one of a psychologist. I'm a psychologist and um, I've been taking care of a lot of people, many of them from our community who are struggling with a lot of depression and anxiety and everyone's traumatized obviously by what's going on. And I realize many people are, are you know, suffering economically right now. And I, I am very mindful of that, of course, as all of you are as well. Um, but I just wanna say that the teachers and the students when they do return to school are gonna need so much support. Um, the task that the teachers have to try to catch these kids up after the gaps that have, you know, that are inevitable because they're not at school on campus. I mean, the teachers are doing an amazing job, but it's gonna be, you know, education experts are saying it's gonna be very, very difficult. So um, what teachers have to do and then what students are gonna be asked to do, catching up and stepping back into the school that, you know, was previously deemed dangerous for them. I have all of that in mind when I say that I think it's super important that we provide the necessary funding and support for teachers and staff at the school. Um, it's not a time for us to, um, I don't know, not do so, I guess, for lack of a better word. So I just wanted to express that opinion and, and thank you so much. And thank you. And if you wouldn't mind just sharing your address, I forgot to ask. Oh, sure. Um, um, I live at 12 Layton Farm Road. Thanks. And we'll just cross-reference Susanna's because I know we've got it from other meetings. Um, is there anybody else from the public that wishes to um, offer a comment at this time? Not seeing any. Um, I. Well, again, just thank everybody for uh, the frank and courteous dialogue tonight. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work on this with everybody. And um, we'll see, see what uh, magic we can make happen. So um, with that, uh, we'll adjourn the uh, workshop portion of the meeting and um, return to picking up the regular council meeting that we recessed from. Uh, prior to this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Um, Thank you. So Good night. I'm here. I'm having some technical issues, so um, I don't you. have video at the moment. Can everyone hear me, though? Yep. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, I don't know what my computer keeps freezing in the middle of these. Um, okay. So, um, I'm going to try to start my video, but I'm worried that it's going to make my computer freeze again. So maybe I'll just actually leave it at audio. Um, okay. So we had recessed. We're now picking up again our special meeting. Um, Having not done this before, is there anything procedurally that I, yes, Matt? I think you may need a motion to come out of recess. Okay. I will entertain a motion to come out of recess. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Caitlin. Second. Um, all in favor? Or any discussion, I should ask. I just assumed. Um, all in favor? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Sadly, yes. I wish I could just go hide in bed right now, but yes. <laughs> Kevin Adams? Yes. <laughs> Motion passes. <laughs> um, okay. So the um, first item 
now is item 65-2020, fiscal year 2020 general fund budget. It's a motion to set for public hearing. Um, anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one. Um, so given the discussion that we just had, I wasn't clear on the dates that were being tossed around for, for which hearings, but was the suggestion that we move the public hearing as well, or just the council vote? Um, that, would, that would change the motion if we were going to move the public hearing out as well. If, if I may, Madam Chair, I, it was my understanding that uh, the conversation was thinking to move the public hearing to the 11th and then uh, move the, uh, the vote for the council to move forward on the municipal budget and to set, uh, and to set the date uh, for the election uh, for uh, June, uh, July 14th. That's, that's what I thought. So we would move this to May 11th instead of May 4th. Or yes. for that. Okay, so looking for a motion then um, to schedule a public hearing for is May, May it is a, a Monday, Monday, May 11th, 2020 at 7 p.m. on the Cape Elizabeth, at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall um, or via Zoom on the proposed fiscal year 2021 general fund budget for the town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine with proposed expenditures. Um, and I'm just gonna say, as laid out in the agenda, the budget would result in an estimated tax rate of $20.13 per thousand valuation. Um, so looking for a motion. So moved. Thank you, Penny. Is there a second? Second, Valerie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, uh, any discussion? Jamie, yes. So um, I think it's fine to set the public hearing with this as the budgeted amount. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that amount is gonna come in lower. So, um, you know, we can obviously have updated numbers um, that, that reflect that at that time. So. I only bring this up to say, you know, another way we could go with this is do some of the work to um, uh, try and get to a closer point to where the actual number might be, and then have, unfortunately, a special meeting to set the public hearing with the exact amount. So I, I could go either way on it. I, um, so, Matt, did you want to respond to that? If it may be helpful, uh, what you may find in the past is uh, when the public, when the council has gone to the public hearing, uh, there have been changes that have taken place subsequent to that public hearing. Uh, so this would be the number that you would have at this point in time. But if you did have revised numbers when you did ended up sending sending it to the council for action, it could have a different number. Uh, the other thing is that the tax rate, for instance, at twenty dollars and thirteen cents. Uh, ultimately, it's set by the by the tax assessor when he goes to commitment of taxes. So, uh, oftentimes, you know, the, it'll, it'll come in at a certain level, but then uh, the the assessor will then do all you know complete his work over the course of the summer, and then uh, come in and the tax rate will come in uh, at that or generally generally lower. So, uh, you may be, I think you're okay setting the setting your uh, expenditures right now and revenues, but knowing that they will uh, that they will change uh, by the time that you actually end up going to set that uh, set the warrant. I'll be a little bit more direct to the point, and that is that for anybody that didn't participate in tonight's meeting or wasn't paying close attention and only sees this is what gets posted, um, yeah. it's lacking the context uh, that. Of, of being a work in progress and a, a work in progress that's trying to to drive that impact down further so you know we're only inviting more comments you know saying you. what are you guys doing you're not being thoughtful and responsible and so on so and if that's if that's the case and we just deal with that so be it i'm, I'm just trying to head that off um uh so i i don't know if you know in, in what gets posted to the meeting invite, it's part of the agenda, and, and anything that 
shows up on the homepage of the website. If there's maybe some narrative that accompanies that, that says this is what it is right now, you know, work is ongoing um, at the direction of the council from their latest finance committee meeting uh, to try and bring this down even further, so. I, I think we could provide that type of language on there too, yeah, Councillor Garvin, if, if that's the council's uh, direction, we'd be happy to put an advisory uh, advisory note on there. Okay, um, Penny. Um, you know, I was going to ask the question, why would we put something forward to the public to make comment on if we knew that it was a moving target? So it's similar to what Jamie's asking. Um, I understand um, uh, wording around something so that you can create context, but I think all we are doing is creating unnecessary angst for people when we know that we're going to uh, potentially um, change the target. So I don't mind having a special meeting. I think what we want to do is put in front of our taxpayers uh, what we think is the closest of what we know at that um, at that point in time. And I think we know we're going to change something. So I would propose we not put it in front of people till we've um, reworked it. Um, Chris, yes. Uh, so I, I think I'm in concurrence with both of those views to the extent the view was, um, if we can wait to set it and set these numbers, um, uh, I'm okay having a special meeting a week or two from now uh, if we can if at that point in time we think we might have something different to put in uh, the motion to set the, the public hearing. Is that what everyone's saying or am I misunderstanding? I think that's what people are saying but just to clarify May 4th is one week away and May 11th is two weeks away. So um, I'm fine with also with the, the idea of having another special meeting to set the public hearing, um, but do we have time, does, does that give us the time to do that budget reworking um, or will we just be in the same place when we come back to set the special hearing? Matt, do we have time? I, I don't know if you're going to have the answers that you're looking for uh, a week from now. Uh, that being said, what the heck's a week? To be, to, to be frank, if you want to wait seven days, uh, you know, we're, we're all still safer at home uh, a week from now, so to speak. Uh, set, you can set another uh, special meeting to sit there and if there's nothing if there's nothing to report at least at that point uh you can see you have the luxury of time to get to that point and say okay if, but if there is something to report then you can make that adjustment and then and then bring that forward and i think that's that's entirely up to the council but i think you have the uh, you have the flexibility to do that if if you so desire and if it doesn't like i say we can come back and then we could we could craft language that would state uh, this is where we're at, you know, this is where the town and the school are at at the present time. However, this may uh, change by the time with the, that the budget gets finally adopted. But if you wait a week, you wait a week. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll direct this to Jamie as finance chair. Um, but Valerie, if you want to weigh in, that's fine too. Is the intention that we will would will be holding on to either the May 4th or the May 11th dates that are already on the calendar as finance committee meetings to further discuss this budget? Um, just I'll pose that question. Um, I hadn't specifically thought about that, but that's a really good both idea and you know something worth I guess talking through further. I think um, I think part of that will all be you know dictated somewhat on some of the conversations that Matt and or Donna have um, coming out of this meeting and um, you know what we might have to react to as a function of that so 
Um, but it's, it, yeah, I mean, it certainly doesn't hurt to hold the placeholders for that purpose if we're not, if we're not using them for what was originally intended. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, I agree that we may not have made a tremendous amount of progress between now and next Monday when we would actually vote. So at that point, it's just sort of going through the motions and semantics. But uh, honestly, uh, it, it, was, it was just about you know, we're all, we're all knee deep in this stuff. And, you know, the people who've been good enough to join us on these calls um, are obviously, you know, hopefully well-informed about um, uh, the direction our conversations have gone. But for somebody who's just not paying as close attention, I think it just invites confusion and, and um, you know, frankly, you know, criticism to us when we're, we're in the middle of trying to do the work to address the concerns that we're hearing, so. Um, so is someone making a motion to postpone this item and we can take up the next one when we get there, um, to a date certain? Matt, yes. Uh, Chairman, if, if I may, if... If the council's desire is to wait a week, uh, then you may you may consider making a motion to table uh, to to um, to next Monday, uh, and then to have a and then to set the date for a, a, a special uh, council meeting or a, a, an additional council meeting for that date at say seven o'clock and next Monday, and then and then you could take that off the table at that point and then decide how you would like to take for an action uh, then. Uh, Jamie, were you gonna make that motion? Well, no, I was actually gonna suggest something else. Um, so, I, I mean, the other way to do this is to work backwards. So first of all, uh, you know, Matt said that by the charter, we have to have voted on the budget 30 days prior to the start of the budget year. Um, so that means voting sometime in the week of the 25th. Monday the 25th is Memorial Day. Um, so it wouldn't be a standard Monday meeting um, that we'd be utilizing anyway. But I, I, I mean, I think the other way to do this is just to look backwards from, you know, let's, let's figure out when we're gonna set that meeting to, to actually vote on the budget and then, and then work backwards to having the hearing from there. And that re that's really what buys us the most amount of, you know, if the effort is to try and buy us time to work solutions, that's what buys us the most amount of time rather than working from, from this point forward. It's to go the other way around. Okay. Um. So, I mean, I would, I, I'm not, I don't know what's on the calendar, the municipal calendar. I don't have it right in front of me, but you know, I, I would, I would advocate for having our vote sometime on or about Wednesday, the 27th for the municipal budget, but you know, pull back a week from there, a week and two days at most to the 18th for public hearing and a meeting sometime in the week of the 11th, if we need to, to set the public hearing. I just, Pulled it up, and those dates look clear. Except the eleventh, we have earmarked already for a meeting, so that works. Yeah, it's it's wide it's wide open, uh, Councilor Garvin. Okay. Uh, so like there's a motion on the floor. I don't know whoever made the motion wants to withdraw it, and then we can go to a different plan of attack. That's me. I will. This is Penny. I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. Um, is so, there, sorry. Yes. I was just going to go ahead. So I, I move that we set, uh, we'll do all this at once. I move that we set um, Wednesday, May 27th as the town council vote for um, the fiscal 21 municipal budget and that we set uh, Wednesday the 18th as the public hearing 
and a special meeting on, I'm sorry, that, that was Monday the 18th, Monday, not Wednesday yeah. the 18th, yeah, sorry. And a special meeting on um, Monday the 11th, um, simply to set well, I guess we would. I guess we wouldn't be right. setting the public hearing the 18th. So it's just the 27th and the 18th, but with the plan for the, the 27th and the 11th, with the plan to set it for the 18th. Right. That, got all that, Deb? <laughs> <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> okay. All right. Play, play and connect four. <laughs> um, yes, Jeremy. Do Do we not have a regular council meeting set for the 11th anyway? Yes. There you go. So we really just need to set the 20, whatever the date was that you said for, for the council. So at, yeah. So at the council meeting on the 11th, we would just need to set the 18th or, and we can set the 27th now. I mean, if we, well, no, we can't cause this is just a workshop, but yeah. So, but if everybody agrees to no. that, we can do that on the 11th. Okay. Do we have a second? Is that a thumbs up second, Jeremy? Um, yes, second. Oh no, we are we are in special oh. meeting. No, we're back in special right. meeting. We're not in workshop. <laughs> it's <No>. getting late. <laughs> 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 uh, um, okay. Any discussion? Um, all in favor of the motion. Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Heck yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion passes. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so the next item, item number 66-2020, is the fiscal year 2021 special funds budget. Again, a motion to set for a public hearing. Um, anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing no one, um, Jamie, would you would you care to make a similar motion? I move that we uh, follow the same schedule that we just agreed to uh, for these special fund budgets. There's second. second. Thank you, Jeremy. Any discussion? All in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, okay, so at this point we do have an opportunity for any citizens to raise a topic not on the agenda. Um, there's a 15 minute period for comments. Um, if anyone is wishing to speak, please introduce yourself with your name and address. Seeing no one. Okay, that brings us to the end of the agenda for the evening. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Jeremy. Is there a second? Second. Penny, thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. And Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Now you can go get in bed, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> good night, everyone. Everybody have a good Thanks, night. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank night. you. Thanks.